Hello and welcome to Beveris Weekly Meetings. Beveris is a cooperative to have everyone enabled to do what they love, share it with the world and live well. Uh, these meetings are general status updates as well as generally a philo philosophical discussion. This one will be discussing the Eastern World War II history uh, through three movies uh, called The Wind Rises, In This Corner of the World, and Grave of Fireflies. This is in preparation for our book reading next week for The Rape of Nanking. Uh, joining me today is Tyler and John. Our usual guests, if you wish to join, there will be a link down below in the description, and that would be much appreciated. Otherwise, just participate in the chat. Um, so I'll kick it off uh, with a few minute introduction into what's new with Beverly uh, this week, and then we'll kick on to the larger discussion. So this is our agenda. You'll find the link below uh, to the movies. We go into the latest topics. Some new things that happened was Google did the Stadia announcement. Uh, this actually is quite concerning to me because it's such a good idea. <laughs> uh, and I've done a little write up here, but it seems I'm very concerned about. Uh, so I'll just say, I'll just read out this bit here. I'm very concerned about it. It is such a good idea. And I'm not sure how Valve, Steam, Twitch, PlayStation, Microsoft will compete unless they all teamed up to use Microsoft servers. Even so, it makes me think that this continues. This continuous consolidation of entire tech stacks means that for all the empowerment they offer, that there is equal disenfranchisement away from ability to compete, which if not listened to quarterly will result in war or mass entertainment suicide. It is most concerning as it means probably 99% of the population get a superior experience which others cannot compete with and then constrains the culture to that, to that major tech company's code of conduct, ejecting others not just from competition, but also from the game of life itself. Now, we kind of expanded on these ideas before a few weeks back in our Tim Pool, uh, Jack Dorsey, uh, Gardy, and uh, who was? Who, who am I forgetting? Oh, the Joe Rogan on the Joe Rogan show. Uh, kind of talked a lot about our issues there. And we actually had some correlations with last week in terms of the issues of not speaking out, uh, like driving. Uh, resentment underground uh, will then result in a uh, in attacks um, as two meta entities a goal like spirits end up battling it out uh, we can probably we'll probably talk about this at some point of work this theme and there's a tweet thread regarding it it wasn't really scheduled for this discussion uh, but yeah so we've got in this corner of the world I did a uh, stream on my own uh, channel about our previous how to read a book discussions. I kind of went over the importance of it on my own channel a few days ago. Uh, suggestions for revising the forum categories. Uh, we've had a lot of categories. I did some improvements here to try and make it a bit easier for people to uh, figure out and work their ways around. But if you are a member, then maybe check that out and give your feedback. Uh, we've had more participation in the quitting smoking advice. Uh, more participation in browser start pages, uh, listing of music that induces flow from different people, uh, as well as a insightful post from uh, someone uh, struggling with addiction in our praxis forum. So again, uh, Beverly's kind of built now on three pillars. One is philosophy, the other is projects, and the last one is praxis. So we try and identify the best rules of the game, uh, work together to improve them, uh, and then uh, provide advice to try and make ourselves the best we can be. So that's kind of it. So it, it's one thing where before we kind of just studied on philosophy the last few years and then we're like, oh, we kind of really need to practice it now. Um, so with that, I think we can probably jump into the discussion. So uh, John, you just finished watching uh, these movies. So can you kick us off for the movie The Wind Rises? Uh, sure. Is it kind of uh, it, it? It kind of reminded me of uh, when we read through the Fountainhead. It, it kind of has that same artistic look uh, from an engineer's perspective. Like, even though I have no interest uh, in engineering, just like I have no interest in architecture or anything like that, it kind of shows a, a paints a picture of the 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 person where this is the the engineering of a 
planes and, and the design process is like their entire life and like everything that they're focused upon. And so that that was pretty interesting. But it's kind of a, I guess, tragic love story where that that's his main career at like in the kind of this uh, race towards building better, faster, stronger planes uh, in, in order to in order for Japan to uh, do well in World War II. Uh, but it, it's funny, the war itself is kind of, I guess, background information because it's just focused upon him as a person, as a engineer and like not even uh, like involved with the war other than how he's like building the things that are for their benefit. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, maybe it'll be useful uh, to give a hold up. Let me get the how to read a book. Uh, this, I, so this uh, mm -hmm. how to read a book stuff that was really useful for um, me processing these movies. Uh, so let me uh, screen share once again. Uh, so how to read a book, it's not just useful for reading books, it's also useful for digesting movies. So specifically these questions were really useful. So, okay, so what's the book about as a whole? So uh, the reason why we chose these, or I, I should say I chose these three movies, is a good preparation for The Rape and King. So they kind of show uh, The Wind Rises is uh, details about 30 years before World War II. Uh, and I don't think it actually covers World War Two. I think it uh, is more around World War One, maybe, um, or around that time. And then in this corner of the world, engraver the fireflies. That, uh, so in this corner of the world, probably covers maybe ten to fifteen years preceding World War Two and World War Two, and then it's it ends on its conclusion. Engraver the fireflies uh, begins immediately. Uh, with World War II and ends at its conclusion. Um, but they show the different perspective, like, you know, insights through Japanese culture and then how the Japanese viewed World War II. And especially these are movies. Uh, and, you know, one of the questions with, uh, uh, were asked is, well, what is being said in detail and how is the book true in whole or part? And then what of it? And what of it is one kind of why did the director feel the need to make this movie? And uh, for Wind Rises, it's a good accounting of uh, uh, the role that the individuals played in the imperial government's uh, desire for Japanese expansion, even though they knew uh, that these they wouldn't be able to compete technically with these engineers despite trying. So one of the uh, interest, like pivotal scenes in this is, let's see, uh, yeah, so that's the budding uh, engineer with his hope, or, you know, and then a famous engineer for the planes. But I don't think any of these is going to go into it. But they moved the planes uh, onto the fields via, uh, what is it, by bull? Uh, by yeah. oxen and uh, and they yeah, were still kind of being born in planes for World War One. Yeah, kind of that feeling like in main characters how Japan was so much further behind than the the West in, in all their efforts, and so like this kind of race to try and catch up, even though they were already so far back in like trying to get closer towards. Uh, what the West had already accomplished. And so, yeah, the beginning of, of the the film starts just uh, just after World War One, and then it kind of goes through his life up to the point of, like, uh, World War Two starting, and then, like, I think the end of the movie ends with around the same time as uh, the end of World War Two. also. Yeah. And it's also interesting, so The Wind Rises, they have a uh, German uh, correspondent, so it also ties into relationships between Japan and the rest of Europe uh, preceding World War II, and it was relatively friendly, uh, especially, yeah, uh, and I think uh, Wind Rises, I'm not sure exactly, okay, so 
It starts off in 1918, the wind rises. Uh, it goes through the uh, 1923, 1932. Uh, let's see, when was World War One? I? I think it, it ended in 1914. 1914. Okay, so it starts just after uh, World War One. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. So, sorry, just after World War One commences, I should say. Um, so that's the the wind rises. But it's interesting. So uh, there's actually so the wind rises is a coalesce coalition coalescing coalition co coalescent. It's a combination of two uh, sources. So one is a fictionalized, like, so it's the kind of like a fictionalized biopic of Jiro Horikoshi, uh, the Mitsubishi engineer, as well as uh, the book, uh, The Wind Has Risen. Now, The Wind Has Risen was more about uh, the uh, relationship side uh, to this movie and... Uh, kind of ties it in so there's kind of two unrelated story stories or semi-related and they kind of tied them into a cohesive story for better storytelling um now it's, it's, it's kind of interesting following there's a bit of a struggle between the the character in trying to design planes according to their like best qualities like trying to create beautiful works of art with the understanding that they're going to be used in war efforts and like uh, for for killing it and uh, it, it's it, I don't know it's, it's, it doesn't seem to be uh, that much of a problem I guess for him but it is an interesting because the way we see the, uh, the his I guess perspective it's very much focused on the artistic aesthetic side of how he's designing these things according to their purposes and not seeing it from the uh, like war war torn perspective of people going down and uh, sh shooting up other like shooting people on the ground or or other planes out of the sky things like that we yeah we see a almost rose tinted glasses of this man's perspective on the uh, war plans that he was making. Except his nightmares or his dreams, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like, that's kind of yeah. been the, uh, the apocalyptic end to uh, all, all of his efforts and the efforts of others like him. Yeah, so the movie was like a combination of his uh, kind of his engineering pursuits at Mitsubishi, which were very much just I want to be the best engineer I can be and build beautiful planes, uh, which was like a vision he had as a kid. And then he's a very famous uh, engineer in in aviation, aviation, what's aviation, 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 uh, and. Yeah, but then it ties in his kind of like dreams as like his subconscious or emotional dealing with it. And then uh, also like the relationship, which kind of is a was quite interesting as well, because it's uh, the next movie the uh, in this corner of the world. That's a lot relationship tied. And it was very hard to understand uh, for my partner, because that was one of the earlier, I, I don't know, Japanese culture movies that she watched. Uh, so a lot of the things regarding relationships didn't really make sense to her. And and uh, I don't know, we had to puzzle it out. But there's this quote uh, by the this engineer, and this kind of sums up what was going on at the time. When we awoke in the morning of December 8th, 1941, we found ourselves without any foreknowledge to be embroiled in war. Since then, the majority of us who had truly understood the awesome industrial strength of the United States never really believed that Japan would win this war. We were convinced that surely our government had in mind some diplomatic measures which would bring the conflict to a halt before the situation became catastrophic for Japan. But now, bereft of any strong government move to seek a diplomatic way out, we are being driven to doom. Japan is being destroyed. I cannot do anything other but to blame the military hierarchy and the blind politicians in the power of dragging Japan into this hellish cauldron of defeat. And so it's 
quite funny. So they sent uh, this engineer, so Pan sent him to study all overseas, kind of uh, develop his skills as much as possible to kind of bring back that uh, 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 innovation and technology and wisdom back into Japan. So the Rape and Nanking at the beginning of it, it kind of accounts how what happened was Japan was more or less uh, you know, very uncontacted by the West. And uh, what happened then was uh, Japan, sorry, America wanted more influence uh, over them and get them to start cooperating. So <laughs> America decided uh, the best way to accomplish this would be to show up with all the military, uh, the naval army and the big fleet uh, on Japan's doorstep when everyone was in complete wooden houses and, and didn't really have that much. And uh, it kind of shook Japan. This is like 200 years ago. Uh, and, you know, Japan being a very dignity and honor focused thing, they felt like they were, um, uh, it, it, it was, they had to then restore their honor after that. So they vowed to kind of never have that happen again, that type of shame and, and, uh, shame that the Japanese made them feel at uh, being so inferior uh, technically. Uh, so then they started sending all of their best engineers overseas to study uh, and then bring that back so that way they could then be like a superior force in the future. Um, but the engineers just knew how advanced uh, the rest of the world was in their abilities. But, you know, they had great compassion for the Japanese people. They knew that you know, the Japanese people were really trying, but it's just, you know, different circumstances, uh, you know, gave a lot, previous, lot more previous advantage to the rest of the world. Um, what else to talk about that movie? Um, something, oh, excuse me, I have to see. Yeah. Um, something. <laughs> Excuse me. Sound like he's about to sneeze. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah. You're now going to be right. in a sneeze compilation. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Uh, so, so, something that always fascinates me about watching these types of uh, films, uh, well, Japanese films, is the such an extreme amount of, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not an extreme amount, but it's such a different aspect of ritual and politeness and like cultural um cu cultural norms that they have that are so ingrained within their behaviors that it, it's it, it's fascinating to see just how different it is because i don't know like there's certain western norms that we have that like shaking hands and, and uh i don't know taking hats off and, and different things like that that are i, I guess more uh, in tune with our own intuitions and, and like our own cultural understanding as it is. But there's so much that just kind of pops out at you in, in just watching how they interact with each other and like there's specific rule sets in, in, in like how, how you eat and how you uh, enter rooms and, and different things like that. There's a, 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 a wedding ceremony performed and just by two uh like people like essentially his boss and his boss's wife working together in order to uh help this wedding be performed and, and they had all all the understanding for how to set all that up and, and do that there within their own home is yeah cool. yeah it was really interesting to to see that happen the uh the boss character was my favorite character he was so good uh, <laughs> he's so uh, short too yeah, well, then yeah. the uh, the next movie would have been really uh, good if you had the time to see it because the next one, it's like a lot about uh, that kind of process. Um, so I think we can probably then jump on mm -hmm. uh, to the next one. Let me, but let me just first see if uh, there was anything. Oh, so the other thing that happened they talked about was the rise of tuberculosis at the time uh, and different disease. Uh, and that's something that even right now, it still baffles me with the world, uh, how plagues, 
pretty much up until like 100 years ago just wiped, well, even up until 50 years ago, just wiped out everyone. Like, it's just crazy, like, how much, like, uh, tuberculosis, typhoid, uh, what else? The, uh, the Black Plague and smallpox. Yeah. Smallpox, measles, all these mm -hmm. things. They just, like, killed everybody. It's just, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's really, really crazy to me. Um, and so her wife in this one, which is more fictional, because, uh, yeah, she, I, that was more about the book. So the book kind of went into how the wife, there was a lot, so you'll find in a lot of Japanese movies, especially the other movies by the guy who did Your Name, uh, as well as the one will, well, actually not the one will, uh, yeah, but a lot of them, the they career always comes first. So there's someone's work potential, their potential to contribute to society goes above uh, relationships, romance, love. So mm -hmm. the um, the in this one, there's a battle between how much he should be working uh, versus how much he should be spending with his uh, infected uh, wife. Um, and there's a bit of a struggle there. Um, and, but in this one, it's quite interesting because I think because it was pre world war two, the, uh, the women were, uh, at least in this one, the women were very compassionate. Um, whereas in the other movies, uh, the women become more and more, uh, tyrannical over the family. And it seems like World War II uh, was maybe quite influential in that in terms of a lot of the men left and uh, or died. And um, the women had a lot to pick up for, I guess. <laughs> and But all right, let's, uh, let's jump on to the next one. So in this corner of the world. Um, and I'll share this movie poster so one can see for the scrolling that was actually really useful doing these movie posters and made like scrolling are really easy so okay so in this one we get a girl it goes i think from yeah her childhood affinity growing up um uh in a poorer no i think they were fairly middle class and then uh, uh, the war starts breaking out and she then marries to uh, uh, a someone who I think he's an engineer on the boat. So he works in the docks and sometimes he goes uh, ashore. Uh, so she's very young, I guess, when she gets married to this boy. Uh, okay, maybe teenager, late teenager. And she's also kind of the airhead of the uh, family. Um, and they always joke about how uh, there's a lot of jokes in there about how she's a bit of an airhead and not really know the ways to do things. But that kind of allows her to be a lot more creative. So when there is food rations and things, she knows she invents all these different recipes uh, from all these books or, you know, improvises from all these books and picks all these foreign uh, you know, all these plants and kind of becomes a forager and a hunter gatherer and that kind of sustains them. Um, but there is like a lot of uh, horrific uh, things in here. So they lived on one of the main naval bases. Uh, when she got married, she moved in with her husband. You know, they were, husband works at the naval base and on the boats, she has to live there in like these hills. Um, and uh, then eventually the homes start getting firebombed routinely and the war ends up going to their own home. Uh, so that's like the result of one of the firebombings uh, that the U.S. did. So this is one of the crazy things about the war crimes, right? Which is one of the war crimes is you're not meant to kill civilians. Um, and yet America routinely firebombed <laughs> <laughs> like Japan, uh, even like just it's just insane. Like, uh, and so many people like you know that was that was the town. <laughs> so it's um yeah, it's quite interesting. And yeah, so she wanted to be like a painter and kind of sees things a little bit differently. But she had like this childhood crush 
uh, goes to get married um, and the rest. So there's an interesting scene in it where the childhood crush kind of comes back. Uh, he's also a sailor. Uh, well, yeah, he's a sailor and the other guy's an engineer. Uh, her husband's an engineer. And so they kind of marry more out of strategy and family positioning as things go with arranged marriages. Um, so they don't really marry for romance, but, you know, that's fine. Like uh, I talked previously, I think, in the last uh, discussion how um, monogamy uh, helps to eliminate uh intergender competition so it helps to eliminate male and male competition and female to female competition so if you have arranged marriage in a strong monogamous society then the males work together and the females can work together because they're not going to be competing over resources but then you know so there's a de dedication to be a good wife and a dedication to be a good husband um and in this time then you know the husband's jobs were to fight in the war and the woman's job was to kind of hold the fort of home and you know her being an airhead uh so her uh sister-in-law uh her husband uh died and she kind of comes home and there's a lot of bickering actually about what is correct conduct for a woman uh in that type of society and she gets better and better over time to be a better um housewife and a lot of it is about like when you go to asia on special celebrations the women do so much makeup um, and it always surprises me uh, because, I, I, at least for me, it's 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 kind of crazy. Uh, but for them, uh, there's a bit where she goes to meet her husband when he comes back from war, and the and she didn't. She goes to go out, and then the um, the family are like, "You can't go out like that." And so they kind of teach her how to, you know, be a proper good Japanese housewife. So then she does all the makeup and everything. And then the husband also being a little bit confused and in wartime, he's just like, why do you look so pale? <laughs> so it's quite, quite funny. Uh, and so they're kind of both learning like the ways uh, it is. And But eventually war breaks out uh, in their hometown. Not often, but yeah, so not only does everything get firebombed, uh, you know, they start dropping these bombs that land and then they explode after like a 60 minutes or 20 minutes. So you think everything's safe, everyone, or maybe they'll even explode like 24 hours later. So they do all the firebombing, then, uh, you know, when everyone goes back to pick up everything, uh, then the bombs start exploding. Uh, and it's just crazy like so she ends up having like their family suffer really hard uh under that and like you kind of see it from a completely different perspective like they're just trying to do their best they're trying to like you know make japan proud they think that uh they're fighting uh for peace so i have this post here right after i watched this movie uh uh, Japan, World War II. Let's see if it pops up. Yeah. No. Um, let's see. World peace. Ah, okay, here we go. So, uh, so this was kind of my summary of it. Um, so Japan's, it is interesting as their desire was to create world peace through a global nation, a common ideal even today. Left has come to mind as well as the United Nations 2030 agenda. However, as seen and perhaps now philosophically obvious, its application causes war, as it means those who disagree with us are against us and are thus our enemies. Enemies that are preventing our accomplishment of a global nation of unanimous agreement are thus must be either controlled, think UN or Japan's Asia co-prosperity sphere, or eliminated, think Japan's war in USA or Nazi Germany's Third Reich or Italy's Basio Vitali. Uh, these points are elaborated on later. So as a side note, the film also dealt with the hardships of the Japanese people, with, uh, had, and also with the hardships that surrender caused. The hardships were, so when uh, Japan surrendered, uh, it kind of meant that the hardships were for nothing, that they had lost to violence and let violence win. 
I imagine there would have been many suicides due to the inability to reconcile this existential cognitive dissonance, as a major re-architecting of the maps of meaning would have had to been required. For instance, while the war was ongoing, they conceptualized the struggles as accumulated liabilities for an, an inevitable victory of world peace. However, when they surrendered, suddenly their liabilities, which previously had purpose, now had none and had to be faced as terrible losses for naught. So Japan's particular ideal of a global nation of world peace came from these Buddhist origins, so the Haku Ichu. So eight crown cords, one roof all under the one roof, was a Japanese political slogan that became popular from the Second Sino-Japanese War to World War II and was popularized in a speech by Prime Minister uh, in 1940. So it's quite, uh, quite interesting. And so it was by this nationalistic Buddhist, uh, Tanaka Chikaku, Chikaku uh, and da, 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 uh, yeah which led to Japan's governmental desire for one united Asia. So the great, Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. What a name. So it uh, was an imperialist concept created and promulgated for occupied Asian populations from 1930 to 1945 by the Empire of Japan, extended across the Asia Pacific and promoted the cultural and economic unity of East Asians, Southeast Asians and South Asians and Oceanus. It declared the intention to create a self-sufficient block of Asian nations led by the Japanese and free of Western powers. Uh, and also there was the idea of Pan-Asianism is an ideology that promotes the unity of the Asian peoples. Several theories and movements of Pan-Asianism have been proposed specifically from the East, South and Southeast Asia, motivating that the movement has been resistance to Western imperialism and colonialism colonialism and a belief that Asian values should take precedence over European values. During the Cold War, the movement became less vigorous as the nations in the region aligned with one blah, 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 blah. Um, at the same time, Japan was being influenced by the rejection of Japan's proposal for racial equality to the League of Nations. Oh, sorry, that should say racial equality. At the same time, Japan was being influenced by the rejection of Japan's proposal for racial equality to the League of Nations, of which the Western nations rejected as they practiced strictly Western migration and viewed non-Western migration as a security threat. This rejection resulted in a positive feedback loop of rejection culturally and economically between the Japan and the West, as the rejection made them consider each other ideologically maligned. So, it was really interesting, and this is not covered in Rape of Nanking. They kind of touch over this, but they don't go into it in detail. So uh, in 1919, there was a Paris Peace uh, Conference. Um, and also after this, then they tried to set up the League of Nations. So like a former thing um, after World War One, just after World War One. Um, and so they tried to set up the League of Nations. It all fell through. And one of the leading proposals was uh, Japan's proposal. The equality of nations being a basic principle in the League of Nations, the, the high contracting parties agreed to accord as soon as possible to all alien nationals of states, members of the League, equal and just treatment in every respect, making no distinction either in law, in fact, on account of their race and nationality. Um, and Australian Prime Minister Billy Hughes uh, was the most vocal opponent against it. Um, and then Canada and USA kind of sat on the sidelines, but eventually uh, uh, the, the Aussies got the, the wish of maintaining a white Australia. Uh, and everything fell through. Um, and that kind of, again, uh, Japan after World War I faced a lot of sanctions because uh, the West viewed them as a potential emerging power and emerging power meant emerging threat uh, to them. So uh, this kind of cemented to Japan that the West are against us. They do not believe in racial equality. They want to, uh, they want to dominate. And so they entered into like, let's unite all the Asian people um, and build this uh, Asia that is outside of Western influence to kind of combat this evil of um, 
uh, what would you call it, nationalism that the, like if the West can be nationalistic, then why can't the East be? That was kind of their ideas. So Japan's awakening from that rejection to the racial tensions in the West seemed to cause two things to occur. First, its ideological and economical alienation from the West result in the West being considered an enemy to the nation and their ideals. Understandably so. This then resulted in any Asian countries that align with the West to also be considered an enemy. And at the same time, Japan seemed to awaken to the racial realism and naturalism philosophy that existed everywhere but Asia, which they then adopted from an Asian perspective. So an investigation to the global policy with the Yamato race as nucleus and eugenics in Japan. So after that rejection, that was that kind of stunned them. And they were like, why the hell are the West practicing nationalism? And then they started researching the reasons why the West was practicing nationalism, and they adopted them. <laughs> so all of this ended up with the alienation of Japan's ideals and economics coming to a foot with the declaration of war against the USA. So the Japanese declaration of the war in the United States and the British Empire. And if you read through this, it's actually really interesting. Uh, uh, it's kind of what I what I said here. So to ensure the stability of East Asia and to contribute to the world peace is the far-sighted policy which was formulated by our great illustrious imperial grandchild. Uh, so more than four years have passed since China, failing to comprehend the true intentions of our empire and recklessly courting trouble, disturbed the peace of East Asia and compelled our empire to take up arms. Uh, blah blah blah. Our confident expectation. Uh, that the task bequeathed by our forefathers will, will be carried forward and that the sources of evil will be speedily eradicated and an enduring peace immutably established in East Asia, preserving thereby the glory of our empire. It's, uh, it's really interesting. Uh, so then we start yeah, seeing... Who, who, uh, who are they focusing yeah. on there? What do you mean? In that passage, well, anyone in that... Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, so this would be the thing, which is the uh, the desire for a nationalized Asia uh, free from Western influence. But the uh, the West likes to have their hand meddling with all sorts of pies. How long a history had Japan <clears throat> with China, mainland China? Pardon? How long yeah, very did long Japan history, have history yeah. with mainland China prior yeah, to the influence long. of the West? Yeah, but the... Uh, but I'm not sure exactly how much they were concerned uh, with the fighting that much because in Rape and Nanking, uh, they I mean, talked about to, how... I think I have to go back even before the first Sino-Japanese War. But... Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> there there what is quite I, a long history yeah. there. There's nothing... Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say that adopting any kind of nationalist tendency tendencies uh, would was very much of a shift from an imperialistic um, and before that shogunistic and before that who, who knows I, I mean, I'm not all that well versed on the the deep history of Japanese culture but um, it seems like a fairly straightforward trajectory in the way that they were behaving in the region. Uh, I, I don't see how the West influenced them a great deal other than it uh, being a demonstration of power. I, I mean, I think Japan is pretty foolish to take J to the United States on uh, at the same time that they were taking China on, but they, uh, well, the, uh, yeah. I mean, their initial strike was pretty good. So, oh. Whoops, sorry, I had it presenting on everyone so no one could see your, your face when you were explaining that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, so the Rape and King, like they go into, uh, kind of like that prehistory a lot. So how both China and Japan were kind of plagued by, uh, tribalism, like they weren't really united. Every, there was probably like 60 or more different, uh, leaders all kind of competing for control. Uh, and when America showed up, uh, I think 200 or 300 years ago um, with the naval fleet that kind of shook Japan. And then that's when Japan uh, started nationalizing because they were like, okay, we can't, uh, you know, we're just going to become victim to these other powers if we don't 
have equal power ourselves. Uh, we will just become like a ant that they can squash. Uh, so then the uh, imperial army kind of started uh, to then nationalize the tribes under a united Japan. And at the same time, China also had similar concerns and they started nationalizing too. Uh, and that created, uh, so instead of there being like a diverse, but uh, uh, what do you call it? Diverse yet uh, disorganized uh, Japan and China. And so they started nationalizing to then organize uh, everyone to one goal. And that's uh, created huge leaps and bounds in the uh, technology, the food, all the rest, um, you know, as a nation developed. Um, so that was quite crucial. Um, but then they saw uh, China uh, then. Uh, once they were nationalizing, they were still struggling. So China struggled more with nationalization. Japan did probably because it's so much bigger. Uh, but then they were also getting Western influence. And that kind of shocked Japan because Japan was just like, oh, oh if uh, China uh, gets Western influence, then maybe uh, they'll align with the West. And, you know, we already know that the West is against us. Uh, so it kind of put them in, a, in quite a pickle. Yeah, there's there's no doubt um, when trying to navigate the uh, tricky international waters, it's easy to make some missteps. But uh, I don't know. War seems such a silly thing to me all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like it's the rape of Nanking, like they they're very hard on Japan. Like they give a good history of the the role nationalism played in leveling up the technology. But then uh, the the lady uh, uh, is Chinese, and her parents were in Nanking. Her grandparents were in Nanking at the time, uh, and it doesn't really it it kind of details all the facts of Japan. Um, and the horrors but it doesn't detail the motivations um it just criticizes the actions without detailing the motivations and but when you like watch these three movies especially that one the in this corner of the world uh, and then you know you go through what the stuff was like so again we have um this type of role these things that were being played so germany uh they also brought out uh, blood and soul. So the blood and soul being the Thai. All right, let me. Sorry, I should set the screen again. Um, so blood and soul being the tie between the race and the land. I think Nazi Germany, perhaps even Israel and Saudi Arabia, and also Italy. I never knew that Italy was partnered with Germany and Japan. That Italy were the enemies of the West, and that Italy had similar racial expansion desires as Germany. How Italy has succeeded in brushing that under the rug is beyond me. So the Axis powers, Italy had great motivation. Uh, sorry, that uh, they were one of the Axis powers. So Axis powers uh, were Japan, Germany, and Italy. And this one is Italy's motivation here. So the blood and soil was uh, uh, Germans' motivation. The uh, uh, greater East Asia coast prosperity sphere and Pan Asianism was uh, Japan's motivation and Spazio Vitali was Italy's motivation. Um, so it's all uh, uh, quite quite interesting, um, these type of things. But uh, this one, it seems, uh, so the slogan kind of uh, translates to that part of the globe over which extends either the vital requirements or expansionary impetus of a state with strong unitary organization which seeks to satisfy its needs by expanding beyond its national boundaries. Or rather, um, there was the small space as well as the uh, large space. So uh, at least with Italy, it seemed more like uh, they wanted to expand to gain uh, greater uh, power because they felt, I guess, they deserved it. Um, whereas uh, the history of things with like Japan uh, 20 years before World War II trying to fight for racial mm -hmm. equality and then like a peaceful solution by uh, immigration to support their uh, booming population. 
uh, that were starting. Like, so Japan, rape and King details are like after World War One, after the nationalization, technology really allowed the population to grow uh, substantially and to meet it. But then after World War One, uh, the sanctions came and then that caused uh, their economy to collapse and caused famine because they couldn't, you know, the, the economy was falling apart. So then the only option for them was to participate in mass immigration out of uh, Japan or, um, or to have a war um, or to let the people starve to death. Um, so the... Uh, and then, yeah, we had the uh, immigration, uh, immigration, I should say, it's spelled with an E when it's outward, uh, uh, rejection uh, by the West. And, you know, that's kind of like, okay, well, that just put Japan in a tricky spot. Um, and, yeah, it's quite, and then you had, like, also, you know, the West rejection, that the West regret, uh, rejection of Eastern uh, immigration and the rejection of, and then the meddling with the economic affairs of uh, China. Uh, and that seemed to be, uh, you know, things that kind of forced Japan's uh, hand to try and be like, okay, this is clearly an enemy of us. We need to uh, engage against it to maintain our uh, sovereignty. But when they declared war on the USA, that was. Uh, very dumb, um, but uh, because they could have, maybe they could have achieved like a unionized Asia, but when they declared war on the USA, uh, that was uh, maybe the biggest misstep they made. Uh, yeah. Um, anything to add to that? I think we can we can define all of that as, as as kind of a growth function. Any any nation that uh, reaches its borders and needs to go any anywhere because of growth, it has this problem, right? Has to figure out what to do. Yeah. So, what was the impetus for uh, Japan trying to spread the the great empire outwards? Is it overpopulation or? Um... Mm, no, not really. I it's it's probably <clears throat> it's probably something more like this. When you have a long history of great warlords and leaders, you have to kind of live up to that ideal. You know, you have to conquer the land, so to speak. It, I mean that that narrative exists all over the world. Uh, you, you see the kind of imperialistic expansion in a lot of places like that, where you have a history of of uh, a feudal type leader that leads a large group of people to go conquer lands. Right? There's a it's like a re, it's a really dominant narrative. Apparently, like once it starts going, people really like it. Yeah. But yeah, there was so the uh, first uh, chap chapter of Brave Penanking, the Path Penanking. So that uh, details um, the the economic uh, history and the political affairs and the rise of the imperial army and the role nationalism played. But then, uh, so that was like really interesting. But then they completely fall over when they fail to explain the motivations. <laughs> so, it, uh, yeah. Um, well, it like, just, good... just go back further. Just go like a back a, a thousand years or so, last thousand years in Japan. That that's a deep mindset because J Japanese records go back a long way. They're they're another very adept record keeping people, very much very much like the Hebrews, right? Very much like the Jewish people. And it uh, lends itself to a certain kind of, um, like you were saying before, the the strictness of the observance of some of their cultural um, mores, right? Like it's um, it has to do with this kind of strict observance of recording things. It's all tied together. But yeah, they they keep a detailed history of their ancestry in the the uh, the, the aristocratic 
sector, right? Of course, it. Right. So let me let me just share uh, this bit. So maybe we can cover like the history of Japan, maybe in this session and uh, a bit more because these movies cover it. And then next session, when we discuss the rape in Nanking, we go more into the situation in Nanking rather than the history. And then we can refer people to this discussion. Um, so this one, this bit's directly. So this is uh, how do I turn this bit off? Yeah, there we go. So this is what they kind of say here was one of the prime motivations. Uh, this is the first chapter of Rape and Nanking. Another force that gave Japan its peculiar character was its isolation, both physical and self-imposed. For the late 15th and early 16th centuries, Japan was ruled by the Toku Tokugawa clan, who sealed off the island nation from foreign influence. The seclusion intended to provide security for, hold up, wait, uh, security from the wider world instead insulated Japan's social society from the new technology of the Industrial Revolution taking place in Europe and left it less secure. For 250 years, Japan military technology failed to advance beyond the, beyond the bow, sword and musket. By the 19th century, events beyond Japan's control would knock the count, countries off its cocoon, leaving it in a state of insecurity and xenophobic desperation. In 19... In 1852, U.S. President Millard Fillmore, frustrated by Japan's refusal to open its ports to commence to commerce and taking the white man's burden attitude to what other societies commonly espouse the time to rationalize European expansionism, expansion, expansionism, decided to end Japan's isolation by dispatching Commander Matthew Perry to the island. Perry studied Japanese history carefully and decided to shock the Japanese into submission with a massive display of American military force. In July 1853, uh, he sent a flotilla, uh, which is like a huge amount of ships, uh, uh, a fleet uh, of ships belching black smoke into Tokyo Bay, giving the people of Japan the first glimpse of steam power. Surrounding himself with some 60 to 70 aggressive looking men with armed swords and pistols, Perry stood, strode through the capital of the Shogun and demanded meetings with the highest ranking officials in Japan. To say that the Japanese were stunned by Perry's arrival would be a gross understatement. A parallel situation, the historian Samuel Elliott Morrison wrote of the incident, would be an announcement of, uh, would be an, an announce, oh my goodness, let me try and make this smaller. Maybe that's what's happening to my reading ability. Uh, uh, so Samuel Elliott Morrison wrote of the incident, would be an announcement by astronauts that weird looking aircraft from outer space were on their way to earth. The terrified Tokugawa aristocracy, aristocracy uh, prepared for battle, hid the valuables, and held panic meetings among themselves. In the but in the end, they had no choice but to acknowledge the superiority of American military technology and to accept the mission. With this single visit, Perry not only forced the Tokugawa to sign treaties with the United States, but broke down the doors of Japanese trade for other countries, such as Britain, Russia, Germany, and France. So we do see have this quote now um, of that was kind of the wind rises, the idea there. So as we were not the equals of foreigners in the mechanical arts, let us have intercourse with foreign countries, learn their drill and tactics. And when we have made the Japanese nations as united as one family, we shall be able to go abroad and give lands in foreign countries to those who have distinguished themselves in battle. The soldiers will vie with one another in displaying their intrepidity, intrepidity, uh, and it will not be too late then to declare war. Uh, but the long, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, da, da, da. So then they decided to watch and wait, send, you know, everyone overseas to kind of study. Um, and so in 1868, the rebels achieved victory in the name of the Meiji Emperor and ignited a revolution to transform the patchwork of warring fiefdoms fiefdoms into modern powerful Japan. They elevated the sun cult of Shinto to a state religion, used the emperor of a national symbol to sweep away tribalism and unite the islands. And with astonishing rapidity, the Japanese held themselves into a modern age scientifically, economically, and militarily. 
But the knowledge of Western technology and defense strategies brought back by its foreign educated students shattered the country's old confidence in Japan military superiority, leaving it deeply uneasy about the inevitability of victory in its future showdown with the West. In 1876, the Meiji government dispatched to Korea a naval force of two gunboats and three transports and forced Korean government to sign a treaty uh, of commerce, a move fortunately reminiscent of what Perry had forced uh, on Japan. And that was, uh, didn't really cover the motivation for that, so I'm not sure. Um, okay, blah, blah, blah. So it started uh, nationalizing Japan and the various islands of Japan. Um, so here, uh, da, da, da. so then uh, things became incredibly prosperous for Japan. Now, perhaps if the prosperity had lasted, a solid middle class might have emerged in Japan to provide the people with the strength to check imperial military influence, but it did not. Instead, Japan would soon be faced with the single most disastrous economic crisis in its modern history, a crisis that would wipe out its previous gains, push it back to the brink of starvation, and propel it down the path of war. The 1920s drew down the cone of Japan's golden era of prosperity. When the end of World War I halted the previous insatiable demand for military products, Japanese munitions factories were shut down and thousands of laborers were thrown out of work. The 1929 stock market crash in the United States and the depression that followed it also reduced the American purchases of luxuries, crippling the Japanese silk export trade. As important, many international businessmen and consumers went out of their way to shun Japanese products in the post-war decade, even though Japan had been one, been on the Allied side in the First World War. Uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese expansion was not looked on in the same way. Uh, repulsed by aggressive Japanese actions towards China through the first decades of the new century, and even more so by Japan's attempts at Western-style colonialism, colonialism in the former German colonies. It is now controlled as a consequences of the war settlements. Western finances began to invest more heavily in the Chinese. In turn, China, en enraged by the Versailles decision to grant Japan the German rights and concessions in the Shatung Peninsula, organized widespread boycotts of Japanese goods. These developments hurt the Japanese economy and still further gave rise to popular belief that Japan had once again become the victim of an international conspiracy. Then destitute farmers and fishermen sold their daughters into prostitution, soaring inflation. <laughs> Maybe that sentence was a key connector here. The downturn in the economy devastated the uh, uh, Japanese community. Businesses shut down and unemployment soared. Destitute farmers and fishermen sold their daughters into prostitution, soaring inflation, labor strikes, and a tremendous earthquake in September 1923 only exacerbated the dismissal conditions. We saw this in Wind Rises, that earthquake that shook the train. Mm -hmm. yeah. An increasingly popular argument during the Depression was that Japan needed to conquer new territory to ward off mass starvation. The mm -hmm. population had swollen from some 30 million at the time of the Meiji Restoration to almost 65 million in 1930, making it increasingly difficult for Japan to feed its people. With great effort, the Japanese farmers had pushed up the yield per acre until it would increase no more, and by the 1920s, agricultural production had leveled off. The continually expanding population forced Japan to rely heavily on imported foodstuffs every year, and between 1910s and at the end of 1920s, rice imports tripled. They had once been paid for by Japan's textile exports, but the latter were now subject to reduce foreign demand, intense competition, often discriminatory tariffs. So this is oh. kind of now where uh, the in this corner of the world kicks off um, okay. with the rationing. And it's quite horrific. Yeah. Yeah, John? Yeah, I was just going to ask if you were going to read all this, because this might be yeah, better not, for the uh, Rape of Nanking session. Well, I th yeah, well, maybe, uh, just because all these movies kind of are pre-Nanking. Mm -hmm. um uh whereas or like well not pre-ranking but it's like more the history of world war ii when the nan king stuff is more like i think the nan king discussion is going to be more interesting in what causes people to do such uh horrific acts because like we all so for listeners we discussed ordinary men uh previously uh the which was a battalion of uh by the Nazis in Japan, but it's mostly people who weren't actually Nazis. It was just a general recruitment of the population. And they went on to kill 4,000 Jews. No, 40,000. 
4,000, 40,000. I think it was 4,000. Yeah. Um, and it's about, it's pretty much over three different mass killings. The first one was face-to-face -face, uh, gunshot. Uh, the next one was uh, more systemized burying. And the last one was kind of more the rounding up to then go on trains and, and very efficient burying. Um, so then, but this one with Japan, with Rape and Nanking, because of uh, the imperialism that kind of took over uh, Japan and of this perce perception that the West is evil, it wasn't just the situation of ordinary Nanking where you had the average population recruited and said the men sent to war uh, in Nanking uh, were all indoctrinated and cruel uh, due to that training. They were all that 30%. Like it was like you sent, you had an entire army of SS, uh, the Nazi Secret Service, uh, rather than. Um, so the Nazi Secret Service, uh, the Nazi SS, they were the, um, the trained killers, uh, but they were few. They were only about uh, maybe 5% of the army. Uh, whereas for Japan, because of all that training over the decades, pretty much the whole army was like the SS. Uh, they were very effective killers. Um, but so, uh, yeah, let me, uh, yeah, uh -huh. let me, okay. I, I just no, want to read out this yeah. one last bit and then, because yeah, sure. this picks up on just the history and then we'll move on. Um, so the continually expanding population forced Japan to rely on uh, heavily imported foodstuffs. Yep. Yeah. Okay. In his book, Addresses to Young Men, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Hashimoto Kinguru wrote, there are only three ways left to Japan to escape the pressures of surplus population. Immigrate, uh, emigration, advance into world markets and expansion of territory. The first law, emigration, had been barred to us by the anti-Japanese immigration policies of other countries, uh, as they covered especially Australia. Uh, the second door is being pushed uh, shut by the tariff barriers and their abrogation of commercial treaties. Uh, so all the sanctions they had after World War I because they were viewed as a rising threat because of the, uh, their nationalism. Now, what should, even though they were an ally in World War I, what should Japan do when two of the three doors have been closed against her? Uh, so then it starts going into how... Uh, Things were quite dire, and you saw this. Uh, so this movie uh, in this corner of the world, as well as the Grave of Fireflies, kind of uh, showcases just the horrific conditions that the people face. Like <laughs> it's, uh, they pretty much had to sell everything to get just rice, and then they had to forage for food, and it was, uh, it was, it, it, yeah, it was intense. Like, I can't imagine living in place. Like, it's so weird, right? Like, because in World War One, like, the whole population of, uh, sorry, World War Two, like, the whole population of America, or, like, even of Australia, like, we didn't have rations back in the homelands. Like, our economies, like, kind of continue to function. Whereas the, uh, over there, like, their whole economy was, like, a, a you know, the sanctions and the lack of immigration kind of thing, like, you know, screwed them. They weren't anticipating that, and it, uh, it, uh, you know, the whole economy had to become a unit of war, and it kind of, yeah, it didn't have to. I mean, you can look at it but from what a historical else would you do, deterministic. <laughs> you can no, you can look at it from a historical deterministic perspective if you want. Like, I, I get that, but yeah, I don't think that that is the inevitable outcome, and I don't think that the enormous production capacity that was awoken by the imperialistic giant when it went to war uh, represents the starvation of a country. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah, the, there were a lot of excesses. There were a lot of decisions made that didn't have anything to do with trying to save their people from starvation. Um, no, no, I don't know of any country that goes to war that can be uh, stripped of some guilt, but <clears throat> there is probably there was probably a better way. So it, what's funny about history is the, let's say two people are negotiating a, a trade treaty of some kind, right? 
and it's uh it's it's two ambassadors sitting in the conference room and they have their attache with them a few people standing in the background taking notes and they just don't like each other okay they're arguing over about what deals they want to try to make what percentages and they're going back and forth and one of them lets loose lets loose a giant fart just just lets it rip okay it's the worst smell they've ever come across in their entire life and it clears out the room and that's it discussions over no trade deal now this event this lack of a trade deal will be recorded in history but that fart will probably not make it and it won't probably be included in the calculation as to whether or not japan had bad uh feelings towards america or america bad feelings towards japan like all these tiny little things that influence the way people make decisions, sometimes they just slip away in history and we end up having these strange impressions about the flow of history, about the way it's determined, about the spirit of Japan and its economic engine and the spirit of the West and its economic engine and how they clashed in this big field on stage. But there are all these minor little decisions between individuals that happen that uh, and I don't get caught up in that. That sounds but, profoundly in an actionable, like because the, the point of getting these, uh, I say for the economic theories or those things, like the explanations that we can act upon to prevent such catastrophes in the future. Like if we're just going to say it's about things that were so small we can't understand. That's not actionable. No, I think it's it's true. I think it's true. So when you when you talk to people about um, these pivotal moments in the way that certain major conflicts were decided, say like in the Cuban Missile Crisis and the conversations that were happening back and forth between JFK and uh, the kinds of backdoor channel uh, discussions that were being made, and it, you you start to discover that it's it's not these massive forces of history that are controlling things sometimes it's it's just a few little negotiating tactics between a few individuals and well if but if a person farted or didn't fart the same type of uh economy situation would still be unfolding and they would still require some strategy to act on that that is different from farting like like it's about strategies it's, it's not really about like, you know, well, these... so what, what you're what you were reading there, that narrative is much of what's going on there is the, the individual doing the research and explaining it is trying to they're trying to give motivation and explanation to why Japan went to war. Right. And so they're quoting people who were talking about it and they're giving the circumstances that led to it. And, and so that's their theory. Right. That it was these pressures. It was the con the, the conflict of growth and and friction from the outside world and i uh i don't know it, it, it seems what it does is it <clears throat> it paints the picture of like nation against nation right it kind of continues this narrative of nation against nation uh, that uh, and, and even in the way that you end up having to talk about it when you read it it's like america did this to japan and japan did this to china and china. And, and in reality it could be something as simple as uh, this one imperial lord who is in charge of everybody really did not like that other guy who happened to be Chinese, right? Sometimes it's like... Yeah, it, but it's then the, why did parties. they not... I think you're like, you're reducing people to being more animalistic than human because... The part of being human so, is we should be able to go above these things and then deal with things that actually matter rather than things that are just purely tribal. No, I, not I'll even tribal, but like so even in, personal. In in, uh, in in World War II Japan, uh, some sometimes what you would see is you would see the uh, you would see the emperor and and his folk, and they would they would lie or they would misrepresent what the empire was going through. Like uh, there were there were times when some parts of the nation didn't want to continue the war and uh, there had to be all sorts of manipulations to make sure that uh, the nation of Japan wanted to continue fighting, right? 
so this is the same is true for any other nation that goes to war. You'll have a sizable contingent, let's say, especially if it's a free democratic nation that doesn't want to go to war. So when you make an assessment about a nation going to war with another nation, you very rarely include that subsection that didn't want to go in your description of what the nation did. Right. And then, and in that way, you end up defining whole nations and whole groups of people together collectively, and you lose a great deal of nuance. So you're saying it's not about the, like the circumstances and the inputs to the situation don't matter. It's only about the, uh, uh, personal decisions made by powerful people. I'm saying that that's the primary drivers for much of history. Yes. And I, I don't see much of a way around that in terms of descriptions, but yeah, I like, I, 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 I can see like how, what, like if Alexander didn't want to conquer the world, what would history have looked like? somebody else would have popped up somewhere and got around to doing it. Well, right? Alexander uh, the Great uh, wasn't purely about uh, kind of conquering in terms of, uh, you know, a Genghis Khan style conquering. It was also about assimilating well, the culture. Well, forget about how morally how we look at it. Yeah, I, I don't care. You use whatever word you want. I just mean the <laughs> desire to go over the world and kind of like see it and claim it and do things to it. Right. But it was also to establish trade and prosperity between the different people. So like one of the things was he practiced multiculturalism and that pissed off all the cultures underneath him uh, because they felt that they were all betraying their, he was betraying their own cultures. So that ended up to his uh, kind of uh, downfall. Yeah, I think he came to that along the way. Uh, initially, his motivation, though, was to like be the greatest dude ever. Right, like that was his sense. That's what his training led to. Well, his training but, was uh, the best philosophy at the time. Like he studied under philosophers. <laughs> yeah, imagine, imagine. And uh, so, so, but I, I don't know how one can just like, because say if circumstances or inputs uh, didn't matter as much as personal decisions, then it would mean that uh, it's all about like that um this that like, i just don't know how you would say that because for instance if that's to say if anyone executes those decisions then it will result in those things regardless of the circumstances that they're currently facing well imagine imagine for a moment if we just shattered all hierarchies right just blew them out of the water and then and then a war the, a voice just kind of reverberated through the world and this is the, the rule that everyone had to follow ready go eat <laughs> and everyone's responsible for going to get their own food right in the same way that the rest of the animal kingdom behaves something like that right what would happen what do you think would happen? uh all the exact same uh issues that we've been struggling with since eden will arise exactly again <laughs> yeah yeah exactly right but over time, right? That that would develop, but but the point is, you end up unless we the, unless we had pure abundance and we could wish anything into existence. Oh, no, look, this right? ties but then in. We're this, completely fragmented. This ties That's in true. very neatly with the way that you started this, mentioning the the new development that Google's coming out with for streaming video service or video game service, right? Yep. When you stack up your resource hierarchy, your, your technology stack so high that you have to plug in, right, to that stack. What you're doing is you're creating this incredibly unstable um, and powerful structure, right? And so it, whenever Google says jump, you jump. And whenever they offer you a free new service, you sign right up. And if they were ever to do something that required you to like purchase a new product, you buy a new product, right? Like they come out with a new pixel, you buy a pixel or whatever, right? Like uh, Apple's the same way. I mean, pick any giant tech company. Um, and then the same is true for your feudal lord. And your feudal lord says, listen, peasant, uh, serf, it's time to go to war. I, I have got to go take over the neighbor. The neighbor uh, pissed my daughter off in an arranged marriage and it sucks. 
we got to take care of this. This is our honor is yeah. at stake. Well, there's certainly things like that, like in uh, like when ice uh, Canada was invaded by the uh, the Vikings, uh, the king's daughter. Minnesota. Uh, so it was the um, the Vikings had the thing of the people who killed the most got the got pick of the homes, kind of thing. Uh, but the Vikings' daughter didn't kill that much, but she claimed a home uh, that she wanted access to, and she ended up killing uh, the best uh, guy, or you know, having some feud. And then that, then uh, word of that was a issue. So then, uh, you know, if that broke out, that there was that uh, undignified acts upon the king's daughter, then they they decided then to. Uh, kind of pull out of uh, further immigration to uh, Canada um, and just let like a small little uh, tribe kind of live there instead. So he withdrew like any particular government involvement. So there is like those little personal things, but there's still personal decisions that arise from circumstances. Like these inputs produce these, uh, you know, to produce these circumstances that they have these outputs that need to be considered to make x decision um right so like you could say that fart was one input but then it's just like well that's one that people get over because they still are forced with pressing uh, decisions like a, a fart isn't something that keeps you up at night right whereas how the hell are you going to act when this warrior wants to take over your land because their people are starving? Like that's a different idea, right? That's something that is a lot more worrisome and, and meaningful. And and how would everyone act if they were all responsible for providing for themselves? What it was, I, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying it would go the exact way of Eden where we end up exactly where we are today. Like as long as you have scarcity, scarcity is going to cause people to uh, have to make some difficult decisions. And we have scarcity in terms of resources and we have scarcity in terms of time. And both of those two things are going to cause uh, irreconcilable uh, disagreements. True. Yeah, uh, I I guess uh, a, a good question to raise uh, in regards to each each of the movies is the uh, the the fourth and final question from uh, how to read a book is what of it and so like how can we how can we learn something from these films and this history that we can relate to our own lives in order to affect how we interact with the world and, and what we do with our lives. Yeah. Yeah, and what of it is also about what's the uh, the director's intention behind it. And so I think the so for in this corner of the world, it was like a very good showcase of uh, the motivations as well as the impacts that World War Two was having on Japan. Like it kind of really well communicated the Japanese perspective of that time. I felt, um, and it was really interesting uh, to me. Because I felt like that wasn't really being uh, that hasn't really been communicated at all, and you know it's quite interesting to see that communicated so well in that movie. Mm -hmm. um, but then we have uh, the Grave of Fireflies, which uh, is more critical. So I think uh, the Wind Rises was in this corner of the world. They were more like documentary pieces. They weren't critical. They just kind of told things as they were happening. Whereas Grave of Fireflies, I think that one was really about to, you know, making a statement and providing a critique. Um, so you, sh everyone's seen that movie. So let me just pull up the movie poster and then uh, shall I intro it or does someone want to intro it? You can intro it. Alrighty. So Grave of Fireflies is this one. Uh, it is about a boy and another boy. Um, That's his sister. Or his sister. It was really <laughs> hard to tell, to be honest. I still think maybe it was a boy. 
Uh, no, no, they they mentioned it was a girl. Like he calls her sister early on, and then she sits while she pees. Yeah, it, it was a girl. Okay, okay, girl then. Yeah, uh, it, yes. It, so, the parakeet though is is it hard to distinguish. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so Grave of Fireflies, um, so this boy, I guess he's like 15, 14 uh, in this movie, and the uh, uh, girl is five, I guess. And it, uh, so what happens is the movie starts off with a firebombing of their village, and the boy goes through the routine, and he packs up everything into a little... Uh, so a little iron bowl that he buries under the ground. So he's charged with the responsibility of packing up everything important to the family and putting it in this bowl. Uh, so they go away, they found the entire city burns to the ground uh, and he, his mother is also uh, gravely burnt and he's now then charged with taking care of his sister he relocates to the city to then uh, get family help. However, the family is kind of ruled by the mother because all the men are out for the war and the mother is just like, stop being, uh, like they end up selling all the things uh, for, that he collected, like his prized possessions. Again, he collected the things that were important to him. So he collected like his mother's gowns. He collected his favorite lollies. He collected uh, different things and he had to hock them off and as time, which is kind of like the depth of his childhood innocence. Uh, he, uh, bit by bit, he's selling away his, what was important to his childhood. And, uh, and he sells off all his mother's garments and then that feeds his uh, Arnie's family, but they only get a pittance. And the lady says, well, it's because you should be working. And he's saying, you know, my mom just died. Things are horrible. I need to grieve and uh, the rest, and I'm just a boy. And also uh, take so care he, of his younger sister, too. Yeah, uh, because he's trying to protect his sister from all of this. And uh, so he ends up deciding that the place isn't good enough, and he then decides to become a squatter. Uh, and we see, like, the progression. Okay, these are all just movie posters. So we see this girl uh, at the beginning, and she's uh, none of these are. Uh, let me let me pull up the movie locally and then go through. But yeah, so we see then the incredibly as they so they live out and they do kind of the Walden thing, um, where they find a little place and they squat in the wilderness, and then he realizes very gravely as a fifteen-year-old boy. He hasn't been taught the skills to look after a five-year-old girl, and they fall into poverty and eventually uh, uh, decay and death. And and it, it's just such a horrific movie, <laughs> especially like the last scene of it. Um, the whole movie just man, it's it's just horrifying to me. Yeah, it's kind of like seeing the slow decay of the the family because, like, it, it the movie starts off with the the father already in, in the war in the navy, uh, and then their mother dies, and, and it's him trying to make do with living with their aunt that is. Um, not their aunt that is like hold, holding contempt against them uh, in, in their living space. And so they end up leaving. And then because of their inability to make it, uh, get enough food and also to take care of themselves, the young girl dies. And then it, it's just him. He's left with nothing. And he finds out that Japan surrendered and then from there, it, it, it's just... And his father was fighting. Yes. Uh, wait, yeah, so his that... father was gone because he was fighting, so... Right. Yeah. So, yeah, even, so when, they... even, yeah. even that hope that... It kind of felt like that might have been what was getting them through 
some of this suffering was the idea that Japan, while they were suffering here in this moment, his father was there fighting the good fight for all of Japan. And so after the war was won, all this suffering would have been worth it uh, because they would have gained the uh, what Japan was seeking out. And then it, it's just kind of that slow decay out of it to the point that kind of leaves it with this hollow sense of despair afterwards when all is lost and all was for nothing. Yeah. And so let me uh, just jump into the key bits uh, mm -hmm. and follow the progression. Um, so this movie is, I don't know, I don't feel like there's any spoilers in these movies because they kind of all deal with a the theme and you kind of, I don't know. But if, you, if you're planning on watching these, probably I should have said this at the beginning, watch the movies before you watch this talk uh, if you plan on watching them. But otherwise... Uh, let me just mute it and then I'll talk over it uh, instead. So we have, uh, okay, that's the American planes going to firebomb. He's now, uh, you know, burying that little thing. Uh, so I think just before, uh, yeah, he's putting all the things he cares about into that. Yeah, so there's the lotties and then he runs away and he gets the stuff. And there's such a, like, a nifty scene somewhere in here. Uh, okay, that's the whole city getting burnt to a crisp. Um, uh, the things happening there. Uh, it's quite uh, horrendous. Um, so there's a, ah, this scene. So now uh, he's still trying to take care of uh, this little girl. And let me add the audio for this. So it's really interesting because you see this like with a nice little movie and everything and the boy's doing the best he can to kind of, you know, give this girl her childhood. Uh, Cause, and at least for him, he hasn't completed his childhood. He hasn't completed his growth. And so you see like this girl just completely full of um, youth and everything. So, Oh man, it's like, so anyway, uh, they run out uh, away from home uh, because he felt that, you know, the necessary protection of this girl wasn't going to come. And as time goes by, uh, the, So here the girl realizes finally that her mother has died. Um, and, you know, that's interesting, right? Because very similar to Inuyoshiki, um, with the father's ineptitude to protect his family. Uh, okay, I'm getting the warning again um, about broadcasting things. So he kind of had to face that... Uh, inability to protect his family, uh, his inability to be More sufficient. Like in a, in, inability to nurture his family. It's kind of the inverse yeah. to any Like his parents, family. yeah, it's like his parents were stolen from him and he's failing to imitate them sufficiently. Yeah, there's, a, like, there's an element of kind of the uh, um, Peter Pan running away to live kind of this rebellious life on their own kind of a huckleberry finn scenario of kind of being out out on their own no cares in the world things like that and trying to live just on as little as necessary that that it like you can see from from hindsight how much safer it would have been if they did stay with their aunt even though that she kind of hated them it, at least there would have been that uh, structured home setting for for them to be in rather than kind of going off on their own using the money that they had from their their mother uh their mother's savings and then kind of yeah 
wasting it on certain things. And, I mean, they yeah. didn't like waste it on a lot, but they he didn't know what was needed, like whether or not you yeah. could, yeah, live in a the mo- yeah. The movie really drew like yeah, it's, it does draw a parallel like a silver lining. Like this movie, I gave like a ten out of ten. Uh, similar to the movies last week, but this one is one of uh, this one is the other ones give you personal meaning, and then this one just I don't know, it just teaches you more about life than I think crime and punishment does. <laughs> um, so there's a bit here where yeah, his money runs out and He's now having to steal food because um, I think he tried to get work, but then everyone was just like, we can't afford to pay you. Um, like he did go to the farmer earlier and tried to get work. And the farmer was like, what do you expect me to pay you with? Um, Cause all the food is rationed to the military. Um, so he starts stealing food. Did he actually offer to work? I thought he was asking for food, but the farmer didn't have any extra rice because the only rice was being rationed out. Yeah, exactly. So that's the thing, which is like he... um, He he was willing to trade things, like his mother's things for rice. But I don't think he ever offered to actually work. Right. Um, Maybe. Because I know uh, he's met up with that farmer several times. Um, and I can't remember, maybe my memories, uh, cause I watched this a few weeks ago or a few months ago. Um, so yeah, you could be right. Um, yeah, I, for me, it right. seems like, I, I, I don't know, it, 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 the film never really says whether or not there were these jobs for him to, even for him to work, but it, it seemed like he wasn't even looking it, to see if there were Oh, wait, I guess he went to that office that one time. I forget. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, man, I forget why he went to that office where when the girl was playing with the ants. Um, uh, yeah, so from my perspective, so, yeah, let's let's touch on that uh, later. Okay. Um, let, yeah, let me just talk about that scene. So he, uh, yeah, he, so he gets caught um, now stealing and the guy even says like you know what were you stealing and uh shines like a light on the food um and he says you know you've even stole like baby carrots and baby stuff like you could have left it a little bit more uh so it could actually grow bigger and provide more sustenance so the farmer is really angry the farmer takes him to the policeman and this policeman is actually interesting because so the farmer takes him to this policeman and um this is one where i had to ask that what of it question because i didn't understand this scene really until after i asked that question oh shit i need the audio for this uh let me just set that up All right, tell me, you should be able to hear. Do you hear or not? No, can't hear anything. All right, there we go, okay. Based on what you both told me, the nature of the crime is very clear, so I thank you for the information, sir. I'll take care of this. You may go now. But, officer! You've knocked this poor kid around enough. I'm even tempted to call it, uh, assault. I, uh, thank you, sir. They hit for Kui tonight, you know? Would you like a glass of water or something? So the policeman was the first one, it it seemed from my perspective, who ever showed compassion to this kid from the society. Um, So he chastised like the, you know, the farmer a little bit because it's interesting. So the farmer is just like, 
brings this kid to the placement and it's just like punish this kid for trying to feed himself and it's like the placement is just like like you think about it as this role of the placement during this time he would find kids like this all the time uh the movie um uh in this corner of the world the ending scene was about similar kids um who who like it showed the these kids in starvation these orphan kids so these policemen would be dealing with these kids a lot and you know his job then would be by society standards would be to punish this kid for trying to feed himself and uh you know he's the first character then to show compassion um which i thought was really really interesting yeah um so eventually we see then the girl her malnutrition is getting too severe and even the doctors are like well she needs nutrition but because all of the food is rationed there isn't any free food except for the black market it's uh like the wealthy prospered and the poor starved and it uh so anyway uh, i'm going to skip that scene because it's too sad <laughs> um, but there's a scene uh to the end where he uh so at the beginning it actually starts off and he's he's there in his you know military uniform or his uh thing but you know kind of as a spirit looking over the dying boy so after, so this is like the ending of what happened afterwards so he's in like some city's train stations and he's too weak to even move just with the lolly container right and the lolly container is the last uh part of his childhood and the doc and this guy just kind of throws it away well it also um, had her they, remains in it yeah her, her ashes yeah so his childhood completely you know went to ashes but then it was discarded like rubbish while he perished and decayed in complete weakness um you know this guy's job is to find out who's completely dead to then put them in like a dumpster i guess um and so he ends up passing away and but it's really interesting because these final scenes, um, this is when that what of it question really stuck out to me. Um, because there's a scene where the girls, yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, this one. Oh man, this shits me. So we see here it's this prosperous Japanese family and you know everyone's returning after the war. The old phonograph. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the prosperous family reunites while they look over the tomb of the kids. And I think the, like this, and it plays like this reminiscing thing, and then kind of shows like what life these kids had. Yeah. Like it eventually it reanimates them, but then, so that's well, it, interesting. It, it, it's really like hits home like how much of the time the uh, young girl had to spend on her own, kind of missing her her older brother being there because he was out looking for food and things like that. And she was just had to entertain herself for much of these days that she, they were there. Yeah. So it's just uh, it's just horrifying because uh, it's kind of like I can really show like that type of compassion, like the that the, or the lack of compassion that the society had, which was a um, that the the, uh, the fat like the wealthy family, you know, they kind of reunite and everything's fine. And then they're just looking over the graves of these kids and and it's just it's just horrifying like so much of the japanese culture was just about like protecting society at the expense of the individual now there's actually a book um called 
The Prodigy by Herman Hesse. Uh, and it's probably quite fitting, actually. Um, uh, OK, the, sorry, are these uh, Herman Hesse. Oh, it'll be on Goodreads. Goodreads, Herman Hesse, Prodigy. One moment. <laughs> So this book, uh, Herman Hesse, I read his book, Steppenwolf, first, um, and I really loved that book. Uh, and then he wrote, well, one of the other books he wrote was The Prodigy. And this whole book, I'm reading it, and it's, so it's about a little German boy, and I, uh, yeah, around, uh, you know, in the last century, uh, well, the break of the last century. And he... Um, he progresses it watches him from childhood to adolescence and uh you know you read the book and you're like fine sure and you know he's very skilled and whatnot and um you know society's all trying to make him you know in his image and and doing everything and the um it has a similar ending to this one and it's a statement about society's shortcomings and able to take care of the individual uh and it's horrifying because the thing is you read this entire book and you're like fine that makes sense sure and then the end scene is just like it adds that perspective to the book where you're like holy shit that wasn't fine at mm. all um mm. yeah and uh so we see this uh so they sit on this little <laughs> so he buries his si he cremates his sister on top of the mound where they lived their like walled and hermit days and um eventually it turns into a bench okay and this is the spirits like you know just wandering over the land through time as time passes uh come on google be nice i'm, I'm trying my best here and there is modern Tokyo. So that's uh, that ending scene. I really struggled to process because um, it was like, why are they? Uh... Yeah, I don't know. John, you take over a bit, otherwise. <laughs> yeah, it, it it raises the question of what was the, I guess, meaning toward, for their suffering. Because like, it, it's easy for us to accept suffering that's imposed upon us when we have some sort of reasoning behind why it's happened to us and like what we're gaining from it in the end. But for all of the, the instances of, of suffering and, and it, it's just like an ever increasing kind of despair where there's nothing gained from it but just everything kind of slowly being taken further and further away until it's they're left with nothing and uh even even their nationalistic hopes for their their empire as a whole to continue after them has uh, they've um, they've given up in, in the war and, and been defeated and, and, and they've surrendered. The, it, yeah, it, it, it doesn't give us any real satisfaction in, in, in how we're able to cope with this, really. No. And like, I don't think I cried in this movie when I watched it, or maybe I did. I think I think I teared up, but it was only when I thought about that significance of that end scene, 
and actually ask those questions that's when like it's interesting like i watched the movie and it was kind of fine it's only when i asked the questions about it um it kind of affected me so it's like you know we have that scene of you know like the end we like it starts off and it's just like like the animation is like they capture the spirit of like this girl's youth so mm -hmm. well and you see this like complete decay and then um and then like the only person who shows compassion to these kids is the uh the policeman who is the one who's obligated to punish them whose duty it is to punish them and that's that's really telling to the state of the society which we then see when the wealthy family reunites and they're like oh my gramophone oh all my rich things in my home it's all okay and they look out oh, what a beautiful day as the guys just buried his sister and See, it's, yeah when i i had watched it, i never even realized that 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 was the rich family that like yeah, I, I guess when trouble came, they, they they and their family just kind of moved off to, into the country to their their summer home or something like that for all of this, and none of the wreckage and any any of that bothered them at all. Like it was just completely out of their their mindset, and, and so like all of this experience was forgotten, or or not even forgotten. It, it was just. Uh, the unrecognized yeah and then yeah we go back to the forefront like that that uh that intro scene of it where the guy is holding on to his last bit of his childhood and his sister's ashes that he failed to protect while he himself is decayed and turned like rubbish and along with all the other orphan kids in that subway all perishing and then those two spirits then overlook the new Tokyo from the grave. And then it's like, like the statement there is, you know, like that Tokyo is, or that city, like the Japanese empire now is like built on the graves of these who suffered without compassion and silence, like those who society neglected. And it's just like, oh man. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, the, the society of today it doesn't even look backwards to, towards their lives at all either. It's, it's <laughs> just completely kind of brushed aside to, to deal with modern issues that have no, no meaning behind them at all. Yeah. And it's hard as well because like I have a big protecting instinct and you know, fairly good, I guess. I don't know. Uh anyway, there's nothing that an individual could do in this. Like this is the problem. It's like like there wasn't anything for anyone to do. Like I could be as frustrated as this situation as I could back then. But it's just like this was a systematic, like a systemic issue. And it's the same thing with like the prodigy. It's like, yeah, it's like where it's, I guess, David versus Goliath, but Goliath wins. And it's like, you know, you can't just like be frustrated in this and then fight like as some external enemy to kill. Because it's like the enemy that caused these kids to die was i don't know like you know that's the thing it's just like it has to ask those questions like acknowledge that because there's such risk to like kind of making that mistake again and especially for like like uh a lot of right winning of right well no i shouldn't say right leaning that's incorrect forget i said that but i was going to say like you know a lot of people with modern discourse uh who are pushing against the left they kind of have an issue with welfare and Medicare and things like that. And there's good issues to be had, the very ineffective processes, right? But then there is people who have been neglected and they need help. 
And, you know, the rights kind of solution, or I shouldn't say the right, okay, the conservative solution to that would be through family and charity and uh, and religion and different communal uh, and the community, whereas the, uh, the, what would you call it, the uh, leftist solution to that is kind of like a bigger government. Um, I shouldn't say left, like what would you call it, the um, progressive solution to that is bigger government. I just say the Democrat because it's very clear from the USA politics. Uh, so the Democrat solution to that is bigger and bigger government to kind of uh, sort out those neglections. But you can have the biggest government in the world, like you know, with Soviet uh, Russia and its neglection of the individual. When you read through um, Gulag Archipelago. Or you have, you know, huge governments in Nazi Germany and those neglections of individuals. Or you have this one here in Japan and its neglection. And it's just like no matter whether it's left or right, that's why those terms are, you know, very problematic is like there's still this issue of neglection of an individual. But, you know, at the same time, it's like, well, what caused these things? So then it's just like, okay, if it was true to, and this is where I think it kind of does come together where like the UN does, did its ambitions were trying to solve these issues that this movie raises, which is if it was a lack of immigration for Japan that caused the suffering and all this catastrophes, like even USA's fire bombings and the Hiroshima blast and Japan's cruelty to China uh, with Nanking, that it's like, you know, then we need to address those strategic issues uh, with those horrific circumstances that causes more horror to ensue. And in which case that would make sense why the UN has propagated globalism and mass immigration to prevent those internal countries which need emigration outwards uh, from having situations like this movie. And it's like, well, you know, good, good effort there trying to solve this issue, right? <laughs> because it's like, okay, but then you have like, could immigration solve this? Like we're kind of resting now with that question. Could immigration, voluntary immigration, or even a force through the UN solve this issue? Because then you could just import these 30 million Japanese men directly into Australia, which probably only had a population of a few million back then, if that. And it's just like, yeah, Australia would end up in the same starvation situation because they wouldn't have the resources to feed all these people now immigrating to our dry lands that were unfertilized then. And it's just like, is it just moving the problem? So. It's pretty Tyler is, uh, is it still here because this gives so much uh, lean to his argument earlier, which is something I find with Tyler. He presents this kind of radical perspective at the start. And there is, you know, as we discussed, we find a lot of reasoning for it um, through, so. Yeah, so. We, we've kind of hit a point that it feels like there's not going to be inter, national wars anymore the only wars that might happen could be civil wars or uh domestic grievances between fellow parties <sighs> For, let me yeah we can go continue ahead. with this topic but i'll show you so this is why the so we have so this movie uh, Grave of Fireflies is the showcase of when, so they became orphaned and they had none of that right wing support systems, that conservative support systems, really. And the society, like, because you think, okay, was this society that was neglecting these kids or was it just their support systems, which were the only thing there? Because in those types of times, the only support systems is not through the government, 
because the government is needing all the support it can from the people. So it's only up for the people to support each other. And in that one, the support systems for these people were not, for these kids were not there and they didn't have the wealth to prosper onwards, especially due to that auntie's pilfering of their money. Like she's what the kids got maybe 10% of the money from her mother's robes and possessions and the aunties took it all. And it's just like that same type of like, you know, I'm going to protect my family and take you for a ride. And it's kind of like those situations happen. Like that's what happened all through Gulag Archipelago. Everyone took each other for a ride because they, because the government didn't support them. So they had to support each other and therefore they had to screw over everyone else. Um, because of the scarce resources and the lack of social cohesive for support. So here's, uh, now we can go forward again to the, um, the end of, uh, in this corner of the world. And I know you haven't seen it, John, but I think, you know, these movies are all dealing with the same subject. So I don't think the specific instances in these movies uh spoil them because it's more about how they go about it rather than the uh the end scenes so this is the end scene here to uh in this corner of the world oh. the commute might be a little difficult i huh Thank you, but you can eat it. You know, we could leave Kure and just start over here. And it might be good for your family's sake. No, it's okay, I don't mind the commute. I'm worried about Hiroshima, but Kure is the town I chose to live in. Uh, uh... It's okay. So, I got a warning again, so that's all I'm going to play. But the, um, it's different, right? So, that's a nut. So, that girl became an orphan from Hiroshima. Her uh, mother was obliterated by the bomb. Uh, and you saw the, uh, you know, the mother's deranged body there, kind of bleeding the girl. But these kids, probably, you know, tw just turning 20 or so, had a good enough support system to make it through despite, um, you know, she came from a middle class camp family and he was kind of lower class, but she married into it. And, but they had a good support system. And I'm not broadcasting any content, Google. Why are you still yelling at me? Um, yeah, so they may be talking about the movies now. <laughs> from that. But yeah, so, uh, and she lost her sister in the movie. And, um, and so when they find this orphan, instead they go at it with, compassion and bring this orphan in and such like a different take than the other ending like you know just a little bit of compassion would have gone so far so yeah uh and uh so that's kind of like then saying like you know we need to set up those like social communities because even if uh you know us as individuals need to be a little bit more compassionate despite you know the greater larger meta battles that our society's gods are fighting or that you know our society emboldens as the entity of a god and but even still, like the spirits of the individual still have to find ways to work together. And it's like, it's just so interesting. 
Because, like, you know, you have these layers at, like, the micro level of the individuals where they can be completely neglected or facilitated, but then you have these meta assimilations of the people in the same way our genes have their intentions and then we have this meta body of ourselves uh, kind of guarding these genes. And it's, uh, uh, you know, so to our genes, we would be society's god kind of thing. The, the gene society's god and it's um it's really interesting because it's kind of like a uh you know like these individuals wouldn't be put in the situation uh if you know like that's the thing like despite individuals best intentions uh things end up emerging like you know a god ends up presenting itself and that god may be sufficient or insufficient and if it's insufficient then uh you know and that's to say if the meta uh abstractions from these individuals behavior the larger superset of their behavior the telos that is manifested from the ethos is insufficient then you know of like mass famine and or war ensues and so poverty or war ensues and it's like um you know so then you go to war and to try and figure out i guess whether or not the shortcomings were due to yourself or due to the other and um you know and i guess that was kind of the showcase where it's like okay but it's also like unfair to them to say that because, you know, it's not really just the shortcomings of Japan's society. It is also the shortcomings of others due to their intent to sanction, like, you know, unfair treatment to them. And so it's like, you know, so to that extent, then it's like the UN does get a lot of credit by addressing mass emigration and, and kind of solving those issues that cause these types of involvements. But then it's just like now, yeah, we're in that situation where is the UN actually going to protect us now? Like what does mass emigration just defer the issue? Like, you know, and does it just allow the most populous race to survive? Um, or the most, uh, what do you call it? Like, you know, the Chinese kind of, do very well at emigrating everywhere, but then bringing their culture and their resources there and then amassing it back to China. And that's not to say the Chinese individuals do it, it's to say that that's the meta game that's kind of being played there. And then we have the game of uh, Islam and or Muslim migration, where we have mass immigration there, where they're bringing uh, Muslim culture to other places and then sometimes bring the same problems and then you're having a pushback against those things um, by people as well um, and like that seems now it's like okay so we can solve those things by doing the UN I guess to try and avoid those catastrophes but then you know we're now in a new game where it's like okay well with the un then what catastrophes is that going to bring yeah so let, let's i i guess ar ar articulate what the the problem is that the movie presents where having these types of wars break the family apart where the father is not there to protect and these outside forces are coming in and destroying the cities, causing the mother not to be there to uh, nurture, leaving a young boy who is ill suited to for the job uh, of keeping this relationship with his young sister together and, and keeping her safe what what types of solutions can be presented in order to keep that from occurring in, into the future is it this is it our rise in technology that has gotten us to this point where 
there's no longer such like we we've been able to not suffer from the problem of scarcity as much in, in regards to material resources and, and it has that been i guess the solution to the the film's problems that it puts forward well i think it yeah so it views so, so i think this is it so the, I, there's two problems right which is the problem that society is inducing of onto the individuals the war game uh mm -hmm. and you know the economic game and all of that and then there's the problem that is presented at the end which when you watch uh so far it seems this is the overwhelming message through the animes that i've seen or not even animes the japanese movies that i've seen is that there is an overwhelming sensation here that the japanese culture is not taking care of individuals and uh or rather of individual needs so there's a movie um, by the guy who did your name, the uh, 50 seconds, no, 50 centimeters per second, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, and there's like just so much. Uh, so that one, yeah, follows the kid. I talked about last week where it follows a, a kid through his first love affair, you know, love, not, not, yeah, his first love involvement or his first love. And, but then, you know, that's his high school and then it progresses to like university and then it, progresses to the next stage so each stage she's had a move and they've sacrificed the relationship um for strategic goals because they saw a lot of promise in him and um a lot of movies kind of and with your name uh they deal with it a lot where you know after this magical experience of the youth they go back to this adulthood where they're kind of just reminiscing did that really happen i can't i don't really know anymore kind of mm -hmm. thing and um, there's a lot about just, you know, this youth is this thing that should kind of be protected because it's the last time you're not a kind of minion for society a little bit. Yeah, and that's the surprising thing about Grave of the Fireflies is just how spiritful the uh, young girl was throughout all of it. Like, her smile was just something so remarkable to, to see and that uh, her relationship that she had with her brother there yeah and it's uh yeah so i think so i think un is doing a terrific job it seems of solving the societal causes of that issue being the economic crises the lack of globalization the lack of immigration so all the things that japan said was a concern the un and for and that japan tried to fight for with the League of Nations before World War II broke out, uh, and then the West denied, then it seems like the UN was just like, oh, okay, the West did kind of make a mistake there with its uh, white immigration policy. Um, we could have avoided this whole catastrophe um, if we practice immigration. <laughs> and um, so it seems like they're, and practice global markets and all the rest. So that seems to be what, which, like the libertarians have been saying for centuries where it's been like free trade is good <laughs> like free trade prevents war so it's like you know for that extent then you know that's true uh but it seems free trade within a nation results can result in overpopulation if it wasn't controlled well and in which case you then need to immigrate out and hopefully voluntarily um and that was kind of denied so there's more like involvement there but then again the libertarian uh has those three stances where it's not just like like it's also free trade but also free trade and property so the government isn't hindering that trade and property um where you know a nationalistic force says the uh the government has to have a role in limiting property trade um which is interesting but yeah from so i think this whole movie was made the what of it because its message here is to say don't forget the graves your city is built upon and on the neglect that built your city 
um i i you know kind of like a little reminder of the uh of what you know yeah. of the yeah kind of raising the happened. question of like your ancestors died for for what like is the life that you're living right now worth the sacrifices yeah. that have been made by all those lost in, 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 in our history right so what's interesting is grave of fireface came out in 1988 this is yeah. a 30 year old movie wow and um uh whereas the in this corner of the world that only came out in 2016 so I think the timing of these movies is also important. Like 1988 was when, uh, you know, art before Neon Genesis Evangelion kind of thing. And I linked uh, a while ago on my Twitter um, a, a video, a four part video essay by uh, Pause and Select. Um, and it kind of, uh, let's see, Pause and Select. Uh, it was I think it started with Akira. Okay, when was Akira released? I think that was in, um, in the night. Well, actually, I, I have no idea. Actually, okay, so the Akira manga was 1980s. The film was 1988. So the same year as this movie came out. So Akira was also a movie that kind of challenged the notion of society is everything. Hmm. Um, so it's interesting then. So. The 80s for Japan was this time of really taking a critical look at is the perspective that society is the way to the, the window to look at the world the best way. And then, you know, 10 years later, we had the Neon Genesis Evangelion, where then that took an existentialism perspective, which was, well, what if we look at it from society as then a projection of the individual? And in which case, then the individual's internals is then a projection of society, something an idea that the West has had for a while. And then after that, then that turned out to be problematic uh, as well and insufficient. It failed to deal with natural disasters, uh, for instance, as well as led to certain uh, mass shooters. Um, so it kind of failed to deliver on that um, idea. So then after that, then it's like, okay society and nature matter but also the individual matters how can we integrate these that's kind of been the focus the last uh 10 years with japanese media um we see this with shows like um uh the the more recent shows and it's uh it's quite so one of those is then uh the in this corner of the world right so that came out in 2016 so now we're seeing media from japan about how do we take care of the individual how do we take care of society how do we take care of nature or how do we bundle all these circumstances together where they respect each other acknowledge each other acknowledge the interrelation with each other and you know facilitate positive development so it's kind of like interesting like why would you make in this corner of the world when grave of fireflies exists and grave of fireflies it presents the problem it doesn't present a solution and in this corner of the world it presents the problem but also presents a alternative it presents a solution which is that individual compassion at the end hmm. yeah that is i guess kind of a side topic but it this question was raised for me in, in, while I was reading uh, Douglas Murray's book, Strange Death of Europe, where what can be done for the nations who whose history has been of evil? Like, through, through time, we've recognized all of, of our strategies and goals of, of our ancestors. Uh, have been on the wrong side of history, let's say. And what what can be done for the people that live there now? Because there's this great sense of guilt w within them for what they've profited off of. They've profited off of the the evils of fascism and, and uh, national socialism, 
and, and even though none of the people there right now are actually like holders of those positions anymore right but there's Which still that that kind of like imposed guilt upon them uh, of their history and it's like that obviously has such like crucial damage to the psyches of each of the people alive having this kind of burden placed upon them and like what can they do because it's not their sins that they need forgiveness for it's the sins of people that came before them and like how do you how does a dead person pay back for things that they've done in before dying like it's not like like do i being a progenitor of that dead person receive some sort of punishment and, and how does that make anything right really yeah. well it, that's only one viewpoint of looking at it and and so some other viewpoints just to elaborate on the or to nuance that point then mm -hmm. the successes of a nation is also the accumulation of the successes of the individuals um so to an extent it's also the you know success can be earned or it could be obtained through corruption or coercion and sin and evil and all the rest right mm -hmm. but it's also due to effort right and conscientiousness and and other traits right mm -hmm. and also due to what your uh your country offers so there's many theories like so so that's like a more feminine sociological perspective of where uh, uh success equates to oppression equates to victimhood equates to lacking compassion but then you have the patriarchal one which is like okay well success equates to effort equates to delivering value equates to reward or value equates to sacrifice and not laziness so it's like the two different perspectives when they look at a homeless person, like you, so one side sees a homeless person, it's just like, oh, how could this misfortune happen to this man? Uh, you know, he just needs a helping hand. Um, and whereas the other side is to say, well, how does this, why does, why does this man not work? Why does he not put in the effort, right? And both are kind of uh, equally true at the same time and, you know, the correct medicine goes then into the correct analysis of that specific instance. But then, so I did like a tweet thread a while ago, uh, actually, that I'm, it, it may deviate, like, I think to answer that question accurately, it, uh, you know, we need to deviate from the overall theme of this uh, discussion. But I think it's um, uh, like, so, it's there's also a few youtube videos that are quite good which talks about like so for the blood and the soil issue there's uh where like a culture is well suited to adapt to a pacific land that's fine i don't think that should be controversial if you think culture if you think a certain people is adapted to a certain land some then would probably say that's horrific that's controversial uh and some would say no that's fine um but it depends right because it's where it's misapplied then it's it's poor right so for instance white skin is where it's very cloudy uh, because they need more vitamin d and black skin is where it's more sunny um so they need to emit less so they don't get skin cancer and become sizzled um as a you know in Australia, we know a lot about skin cancer <laughs> because we shouldn't really be uh, why people went to one of the hottest places in the world and thought that would cause skin cancer. Um, yeah, so then the uh, issue is, so there is some relation and to what extent, you know, it's argued and it's debated between blood and soil. But then the more the more accurate one that I don't think there's any contention is culture okay. and hold, soil. Hold, hold up. Yeah. Uh, uh, what right. are you meaning when you're using the the phrase blood and soul? Because that's like the uh, the yeah, it's specifically of the, of the Nazis. Um, yeah. 
So specifically genes and land, but it wasn't just the Nazis as I went in that thread, like it was a philosophical concept that was co-adopted by the Nazis. Um, so like that's to say like the blood and soil would then be white skin where clouds is or black skin where sun is, those are equal. Like that's the part of that uh, phrase. Um, and uh, so there's other bits of that, right? And but then you have the culture aspect. So then, for instance, a culture that practices, uh, 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 so for instance, in one with a horrific winter versus one that provides food all year round, uh, one requires then a culture of saving and of um, accumulating and prepara pre preparation for the winter. Um, and, you know, more, well, I shouldn't say more, but different forward planning and things. And then you have other cultures where uh, food was more accessible all year round. Um, but then they had also different issues like cyclones, uh, like the ring of fire is just like cyclones, earthquakes, tsunamis, um, volcanoes blowing up. Like that's pretty much all of Asia <laughs> is uh, that area. And it's... Um, you know, so like say the Philippines, that's like a culture uh, where, you know, they suffered tremendous cyclones every single year. Uh, and, you know, I've chatted with many Filipinos now and, you know, they're very happy people. And I kind of ask like, you know, how do you do with that? And they're like, what happens every year? Just get on with it kind of stuff. <laughs> like, you know, you just, everyone helps each other rebuild. And then like, like this is a big difference between like Buddhism Eastern Buddhism versus like the Western materialism, which is like in a culture where like nature strips away your material possessions every year, uh, <laughs> you know, you have to have a culture that um, is more uh, like more uh, able to, or something like that. Where well, like, yeah, that has like a yeah. perspective of dealing with that and, in mm. and integrating that, right? Where it's not like a burden because. Like for me, like, you know, uh, you know, brought up more materialistically than, you know, if I go there, then I'll be like, like, you know, I would just try and make my the best home I can so it stops getting blown over. <laughs> right. <laughs> but then that could be completely futile and I get very sad by it. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, uh, uh, so it's quite because uh, uh, so it's like different strategies. So that's then where like the culture and soil. Uh, stuff kind of comes from and so you see this like say uh, with the Australian Aboriginals which is like Australia is a land very desolate except for certain areas um, so there's not that much opportunity uh, for uh, agriculture that was one of the key things that allowed Asia uh, and the uh, West to kind of prosper on um, so there was constraints there to limiting it more to hunter and gathering and some very minor uh, agricultural invention, uh, interventions. The same thing like for the Inuit, right? Like the Inuit wouldn't be able to progress to building skyscrapers because they're in the snow with eels uh, and, and uh, sea elephants and all the rest, right? So, uh, you know, you have to draw from the resources of the land. So like so. To pre so then to wrap that all together, then the answer is, well, it's not just about, you know, one amass power because of oppression. It's they amass power or didn't amass power for personal reasons, be it temperament values, be it better adaption to an environment, uh, you know, be it a culture adapted to that environment that isn't adapted to another environment, like this whole array of things, right? Um there and uh then you know something that i think peterson says that may be misinterpreted there is then when peterson says you know the west became the best philosophy in the world because it integrated other cultures it assimilated them and absorbed them like what worked and what didn't and you know i think the leftists then view that as yeah well you did that by contacting uncontacted people wiping out 80 percent of the population through disease unintentionally and then threatening them with superior technology um and it's just like okay yeah so that happened and that's true uh but then on the other hand of that well you also prevent you know there is 
uh, uh, you know, mothers stop dying during childbirth, more children start, you know, those benefits that the West have accumulated through integration with as many cultures as possible has also then been propagated back into those cultures. And then you have this more nationalistic, racially nationalistic uh, counter argument back, which is then you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, different racial or religious groups then saying we should have the right to be able to, in, you know, be ourselves despite of this, this Western globalistic force uh, instead. And that's, you know, the left generally supports that fine, except when it's the West nationalizing, or as I should say uh, whites nationalizing. Um, and then they're very upset about that idea. Um, uh, when it's just, it's kind of interesting because it's like at the same part, it's kind of gone, you know, the UN kind of brought it about to say to prevent the horrors that happened uh, that would cause circumstantially at a societal level, we need to practice globalism and mass immigration. And therefore, the this kind of multicultural destruction of nationalism. But then at the same time, you then have this kind of rejection from races and cultures all around the world that says, wait, we actually like our culture, why can't we maintain it? Um, and you get pushback from that side uh, instead. Yeah. Um, I, I was kind of thinking, this is an, another, I guess, like serious question or problem raised with the uh, Grave of the Fireflies where the the nation of japan had this large telos that they were working towards the, this their this national goal of their imperial reign essentially this was something that everyone was on board for like everyone it, this was like the men were sent out and, and the wives had to suffer for it and even though there was damage coming in and people dying, this was, it was for that cause. And then by being defeated, uh, as they put it, 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 it's almost like the, the God that their nation was worshiping has suddenly died. And I, I guess I, I I don't know how they can go from there. Like like where do they go from there? Like you're kind of put into a a pit of confusion for how to move on from there. It, it's when when the god of the nation dies. It, it's Uh, everyone that's uh, underneath it, like if it's a top-down kind of thing, it is just kind of like they're just left to die off as well. And it seems almost like w the modern solution to that problem from occurring anymore is to uh, dismiss all the gods. There's no particular god for a particular nation or anything like that there's no grand narrative that we live under it's there's we all exist on our own and we can cooperate and live in peace and that way there isn't that uh drive and fight against each other it, it's yeah, it's like taking away the. It, it, it's like taking away the the wooden swords because we keep on hitting ourselves with 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 them, and just left to play checkers or or something like that. Instead, we uh, kind of present our foe gods uh, up on the television screens and we watch them battle in our stead, or, or it, it, yeah. I don't know. It, it, bo both situations seems quite hopeless, really. Yeah. Let me uh, let me let me show you the clip from 
in this corner of the world where they announced the surrender. I, why? Because they dropped a new bomb on two cities. The Soviets joined them. We cannot win now. <gasps> we were prepared for the worst. They said, fight to the last man. There's five of us here. I still have my left arm and both legs. <laughs> Man, their English dub is so bad compared to the Japanese oh, dub. Oh, <laughs> me. Everything we've done slips away. Everything we've sacrificed. The reasons why we've endured it all. Rice and soybean grown overseas. That's what my body is made of. So we surrender to violence. I wanted to die a daydreamer. Yeah. Definitely watch that movie with the Japanese, uh, the Japanese version. That was that was terrible voice acting. <laughs> well, it, it still sent shivers down my spine. So, it, but yeah, it's wow. Yeah, the Japanese one they actually do a scream. <laughs> that <laughs> we surrendered. Yeah, mm. I got to scream on the microphone. Yeah. So. <laughs> um yeah it's i so that's but i mean this is the exact issue that like the australian aboriginals are facing um and i imagine it would be the same for any indigenous people which are, are now living in a colonized nation which is that the culture that story that they had and richard spencer actually goes a lot into stories if you listen to his thing right like this is the type of notion which is this west uh, has this idea that that story is irrelevant because we all are one. We hold this, all have this national unity. Sacrifice your story, become this global unity, right? And interesting enough, that's one of the the endings to Neon Genesis Evangelion. That he, so the first ending to Neon Genesis Evangelion, he opted for integration. He was able to successfully integrate himself. The, but people didn't like that ending. <laughs> so they remade it with a three movie uh, series. And in that ending, he unionizes every single person into the one soul. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good work, people. Way, way to fight for that one. Um, so <laughs> the issue there is. Uh, uh, you know, the indigenous nations, uh, you know, who now live, sorry, the indi indigenous uh, people or indigenous cultures, I should, what's the right word? Race actually works well because race now uh, incorporates class, culture and genes. Uh, so I'll say the indigenous races now living in Western nations, uh, they, you know, they have that battle. They had this story and these traditions and you know also uh that they were quite adapted for and that's been you know the west has stripped that away so you can now participate in behaviors that will reward you in this new nation that was not yours yeah. and yeah. then that's going to cause resistance and then you have the exact same behavior by uh the white like specifically the alt right, and uh, are saying, "Hey, we didn't sign up for this multiculturalism. We want to maintain our story." And uh, people get up in arms, and it's just like, like the it seems progressives don't realize that this desire for a global unity of culture is what is hurting mm. the uh, that the pain and. Yeah, that uh, pain that it causes I, I the indigenous is also the yeah. pain that it causes the white nationalists. So 
for each individual person, there's a particular individual story. And as, like, say, your tribe has your own story that they also share. But if you were to try to merge that tribe with another tribe, then the story has to kind of lose even more definition to it, to the point where if you get a global narrative as much as you can, everyone is living such completely different lives. There's no actual congruency, I guess, between between all of it, because it's so far abstracted out from anything in the particular, in the here and now, that there's no way to understand like what's the goal here because everyone has their own particular individual goals but there's no larger goal for the nation or what we hope to do and i i guess it's kind of surprising then that the western narrative or the western god was able to uh defeat these well I don't know. If well, as we surprising. read in um, in the beginning of Ray Penang King, which was East was uh, tribalist. Uh, they were still in tribes up until 200, 300 years ago. So they had many different gods, many different spirits. They didn't have a unionized story. Mm -hmm. um, and then the West showed up and said, hey, look at the power of a unionized story. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then they were like, oh, we need to unionize and, and nationalize. And then that brought leaps and bounds. Um, and but then you know it also brought great costs. Yeah, so. I guess. Okay, so in, in the past, when you would have these conflicting tribes, and each would have their kind of conflicting gods, and then there was kind of the realization that oh, it, you are successful at this thing that you do, and we're successful at this thing that we do. And we can benefit from interacting with each other. We have to reformulate our conception of God so as to fit your God in with our, our, our idea of God so that we can be a coherent tribe interacting with each other instead of fighting against each other. That was the system of creating a larger society. But it seems like maybe that, that process hasn't been really put into a fine enough usage especially like how have we how has our western narrative adapted in uh the the, the eastern narrative into it after we've essentially defeated them uh in, yeah. in uh, 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 well, we didn't <laughs> at all. <laughs> we didn't adopt any of their uh, culture. We're, the only yeah. stuff we're adopting now is like Alan Watts and Buddhism and all the spiritual stuff now, which is interesting uh, because it, uh, like, and we're adopting it pathetically. Uh, a lot <laughs> of it is completely misapplied and, mis <laughs> and misappropriated, yeah. which is interesting. And I've chatted with, uh, well, it, it's yeah, yeah. It, it, it's like we've adopted it for our own selfish interests. Like we're not using a Buddhist like conception of like how to change the world at all. We're using Buddhist selfishly to like ease anxiety for working as yeah. a lawyer or something like that. There's no. Yeah national narrative that has incorporated the the eastern narrative into our western narrative well from a yeah from a societal perspective uh there's not particularly any use for it because the west is obsessed with uh materialism societically like that's what our society organizes around developing material and the uh but spirit Actually, there's more of an uptick for Eastern stuff, and that's true correctly to what I mean. So, you know, Buddhism uh, seems to economically have arisen for two reasons. One is the natural disaster issue. They couldn't really acquire materialism, so therefore, um, you know, they kind of had to let go of materials. 
uh, especially when there was so much tribal warfare and as uh, packed on to the uh, the natural disasters. Uh, but then the other issue is it's also an incredibly effective tool for making people pacifist. Um, so that allows easier exploitation uh, by uh, uh, tyrannies and government, uh, what we call imperialistic governments, um, because it's to that's kind of surrender of materialism also kind of um, allows you to like so Gandhi was interesting like he pulled it off in a nifty way but Gandhi was interesting because he was Western he was raised in uh, educated in England then he went to Africa and found the tribal warfares there and the colonialism there and he found that you know then after Africa then he moved to India and so he was actually able to fight this colonialism force where it then became a bad force uh, through nonviolence. And, you know, he kind of knew that that was a way to work, make it work due to the work by Henry David Thoreau 100 years earlier, um, which Gandhi uh, uh, specifically researched. And because in India, as well as in Africa, there was more revolutionist forces. Uh, there was the freedom fighters, those who committed domestic terrorism to achieve freedom. And Ghani was kind of like more the opposition to that, uh, to say, no, we need to show the West uh, that because if you do terrorism against the West, then they eliminate you. Uh, if you do, uh, if you kind of show the West that their way of being is wrong, then they uh, are more likely to adapt. Um, and so I, that was, I think, Gandhi's approach there. Uh, and so Henry David Thoreau, he's got a book called Civil Disobedience, which is the one that influenced Gandhi. Um, and, but then, yeah, so what, shit, what was my overarching point here? Well, you're pointing out how Gandhi was able to incorporate the Western story in with his Eastern uh, Buddhism. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so for the Buddhist, like the Eastern practice, like it doesn't make sense for the West to adopt a Eastern, like it doesn't make sense to adopt Buddhism if you live in a, sorry, I, I just call it non-materialism. So that way I'm being specific because Buddhism is a lot more than just that. Okay. So yeah. it doesn't make sense to adopt non-materialism in a materialistic society because it's the wrong approach. Because if you live in a society where you have to accumulate wealth to be able to protect yourself, uh, then Buddhism kind of offers you a way of coping in poverty uh, mm -hmm. or non-materialism. It's an ethical framework for coping in poverty or coping as a victim. Um, so, which is why we see its uptake in a lot of aggrieved individuals because it allows them a ability to deal and accept and you know provide a framework for that type of agreement and like if you don't have any power over the society that influences you then you need a moral framework to say that that's okay you need a worldview to say that that's okay mm -hmm. i see but yeah but yeah. if you yeah. okay yeah and, and like you can think of like in in the west like the most mainstream like broadest audience for the religious narrative we, we might have could be uh crassly pointed you could crassly point towards the uh, prosperity gospel uh preachers which are those people that have like hundreds of thousands of followers are all watching like the joel osteens and people like them and like it, if buddhism it or non-materialism is the psychological coping mechanism for dealing with scarcity there has to be some sort of psychological coping mechanism for dealing with great abundance yeah well, and with wealth which is kind of what the yeah. uh the west did where you listen to like napoleon hill ayn rand all the rest of those people yeah. like the, <laughs> the wealthiest people uh who earned their wealth uh, mm -hmm. They had a very good moral framework for that. But even the psychopaths who, who run businesses ruthlessly, they have a moral framework, which is, uh, uh, you know, get rich because everyone's in competition and the weak deserve to be slaughtered. 
Um, that's kind of the psychopath uh, mm -hmm. idea. Whereas the um, the wealthy, uh, like the more Napoleon Hill types, is like if we get uh, wealthy from free trade, then we make everyone else wealthy too who wants to participate in that game. Um, so it, yeah, it allows like uh, yeah more greater. But it, it's so it's kind of but again we have like a situation here where it's kind of saying well under multiculturalism you kind of you destroy the stories like you kind of turn the the cultures trying to participate in multiculturalism into like a chimera or a chimera uh, it's you know the a monster mm -hmm. of uh, parts of all different bodies um, and uh, and that's like a, a big issue because, um, yeah, people are very attached to the stories. And like, this is when you get like the classical liberal or liberalism in general. Like, the idea of liberalism was this idea that the individual was greater than the tribal story. And that seems, and Peterson talks about that as well as being like the key point of the West, one of the key bits. But it doesn't seem everyone is willing to adopt that. It seems liberal by temperaments are willing to kind of adopt that, like the higher and openness, or sorry, I should say specifically the higher and openness, it seems the more willing someone is to adopt that, but the lower and openness, they seem very resistant to adopting that idea. They're way more stuck on the stories. And that would then make sense because that would then say that they delegate these type of God meta battles to those people higher in openness, um, which have proven track records. And we can see this even now from Peterson's cult like following, uh, where, you know, as one becomes a celebrity, Scott Adams calls them super, oh no, it's not Scott Adams, someone calls them super fans. So, you know, you start accumulating oh, super fans. These are people who will buy and do anything you say. Yeah, Tim Ferriss. Yeah, so the you are so you know these people started amassing, and they would be the ones who seem to delegate their thinking because they're not skilled enough to deal with those horrific battles themselves. Um, so I shouldn't say delegate their thinking; delegate their uh, just those specific matter battles to other people, um, and that's you know a good idea because otherwise. Uh, like it would be weird. Like I wonder if it could actually exist like a society of only libertarians or only like people who manifest that Peterson hero that where everyone kind of creates their own story rather kind of fills in to other people's. Yeah, kind of raises, I don't know, a, a question as to like whether Elon Musk but, was a self-made man or if he was a... <laughs> A, it's like the opposite of a victim of circumstances, like a benefiter of circumstances. Like, no. well, I also wonder about because that's the thing. Like, there's so many people in the West that aren't going to be st like statistically aren't going to be able to be these types of uh, John Galt's or Howard Rourke's out, out there. In the, and I don't know. If our psychological temperament are, is just our like post hoc reasoning for how to cope with the circumstances given to us, then having a uh, narrative of individual liberalism when we ourselves have not been able to live up to that ideal. It might be something that's just putting us into a greater state of misery rather than something that we can be more comfortable and, and willing to accept our own mediocrity within yeah. the, the broader context of our culture or community or whatever it is. Well, that's uh, that'll be really interesting, right? Because one of the interesting things that's kind of stems for that for me would be the idea that so there's research going into 
or at least I'm not sure how true it is. Maybe it's just complete pseudoscience. But the idea that uh, your gut biome also influences your mood and also your personality to a level. And if that's the case, is this maladaption or is this superb adaption? Because does that then mean in times of poverty, our personality changes because our body changes? Mm. to then adapt for that environment, changing our personality to be better suited for things that have been proven to work historically, not just in humans, like our gut is incredibly old machinery, right? And personality is quite mm. old machinery. It goes beyond humans, right? So we're talking about millions of years of evolution there for that specific behavior. So it could be where, uh, you know, millions of years of evolution has shown mm. that our, uh, well, in times of scarcity, aggression is valuable or whatever. Yeah. Well, just, yeah, running off of that, like somebody that has, okay, let's say you're put into an environment where there is a great deal of scarcity. You're going to need to be much smarter with how you use what's at your availability. Um, perhaps if there's a way that you can let's say biohack your own uh, s uh, ecosystem through the use of fasting or, or other things like that in order to better resource your energy at hand. I don't know if, if there's a certain, if that's like one of the supposed side effects or not side effects, but benefits from fasting is, some i guess surplus from that not fight or flight stage but you know uh resource economizing stage uh that would would be the case it when presented with a situate uh, uh, an environment of instability or lack of resources and yeah. it if we're actually doing the opposite of that as well by minimizing the length time between desire and achievement of that desire. So from uh, like horniness to sexual satisfaction just within a, a span of 15 minutes or something like that, is something that's just decreasing and decreasing our and decreasing our own capacity to be motivated and to act within the world. It's interesting. Uh, I, yeah, I hadn't really thought about it that, that way at all. No, probably a hundred years until we get the answers to those questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah um all right let me uh just i found those tweets earlier uh so the one about the akira the existentialism this is the tweet relating to it uh so okay so the video i should actually say is this one uh pause and selects understanding disaster theories uh so a very short summary of it is akira focused on society with individuals representing abstractions within larger society you know, Genesis focused on the individual as society, and YKK focused on achieving harmony within the everyday. Okay, so what However, does that mean, the individual as society? Like the like, I myself am a. I I I have my own society within me. Like I have my various parts working together. Or what? What do you mean, an individual as society? See if I expand on that here. All right, how do you spell existent? Uh, S after the N. Existent. Oh, wait. X is existent. Uh, yeah. S I. Uh, S A L. Uh, yeah. Whoa! Yeah. All right. Where did, where the hell did I post that then? Um, oh, well. Oh, well, okay. I, I don't know. Maybe you can work off of. Yeah, okay. But uh, yeah. So, so yeah. If I 
yeah, so the so existentialism has always been the idea that um, at least when I discovered it when I was a teenager, it was more like like uh, you know the Sartre. Uh, Sartre was one of the famous existentialists, and it's like this idea that your conception of society is based on is purely your conception. So everything that you see, all the inputs to you, right? Like all of that is just a projection of your mind. Uh, the matrix kind of uh, is a, you know, touches on that theme where it's just like you think the matrix is all real and then you take a pill and then your mind awakens and you see everything differently, right? And so that's like the red pill moment. Whereas the, um, but it goes the other way uh, as well, which is that uh, if that's true, then your internal state is also a representation of society um, as well. So in Neon Genesis, it's like following these teenage kids who then amass so much power uh, kind of thing that they as individuals are now their internal state impacts society. Hmm. Um, so them as now an individual, uh, you know, so their perception of society is their own individual thing, but then their individual actions also affect society directly too. Um, so it's it, this interesting balance, like kind of between the two, when if you watch Akira, everything, like nothing is first person in Akira. Everything is you're watching individuals run around. It's all watching it from societies, like, you know, from like drone footage type style stuff. Uh, where it's all like, you know, it's all the operating of society as if the individuals are ants mm -hmm. and in that kind of way. Whereas Neon Genesis is like a big breakthrough where it's like, oh, individuals can, uh, like it all dealt with like the, 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 it, so at some point through the series, the, the lead character Shinji, well, all the characters actually end up having these huge psychological breakdowns. Uh, because, you know, the teenagers tasked with protecting the world. Um, and it's quite funny because in Australia it aired um, on like the 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. time slot when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, this is a show for kids. And I think the people who watched the like, you know, who were like, oh, it's an anime. It's like Pokemon. And so I watched it, and then like, I'm like, this is not for kids. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, as the thing progresses. Uh, and yeah, so then eventually, uh, you know, the endings are kind of like how the characters deal with their own breakdowns and whether or not they can integrate and, and what the disintegration means for society. Because in the world of Akira, the individual actions don't really matter at all. Mm. Uh, like there's some individuals, but at the end, it's like more presenting this like some of the characters are more like abstractions for societal events. So one of the characters is like an abstraction of the nuclear bomb. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of like presenting these forces. It's like a whole thing about forces where Neon Genesis is more about um, individuals and their perceptions. Uh, and then YKK uh, is more like, I don't think you've seen one like this. Well, so, maybe uh, so like, your name would kind of fall onto this. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's presented as cute girls doing cute things. Um, so it's like your everyday soap opera of like, hey, look at these individuals doing cute things. So it's more about, so yeah, focus on achieving harmony within the everyday. However, um, then, yeah, natural disasters and things happen and they had to be forced to deal with that. So then... However, toxic harmony emerge, which is what they're now trying to figure out. How do we balance a focus on, uh, you know, society circumstances, individual circumstances, and then like just achieving this utilitarian harmony uh, because all of these are insufficient on themselves. And now we're seeing media from Japan trying to tackle those. Um, so like, uh, yeah, so it's quite interesting because mm. um, I kind of say like that, Japan is living like 10 years in the future or even maybe 20 years in the future because yeah. the West is still struggling with this. We still haven't acknowledged toxic harmony exists. 
Well, like Japan acknowledged that like now 15 years ago, and now they're trying to figure out how what to do about it, or at least the media is. Whereas right now, the media for us is still pushing for this, uh, which is interesting. Um, and, okay, so the other one, the great concern here is uh, for that freedom fighters thing, this is the thread related, and this actually came from a discussion with you, John, so you can credit yourself. Uh, so forget left versus right, the entire spectrum includes terrorists. Real battle is self-righteousness and group righteousness versus, uh, versus societal righteousness. As long as individuals and groups consider themselves more righteous than society, then terror will ensue within that society. The next question then becomes, is terrorism ever justified? That's a hard question to answer. Many are open supporters of freedom fighters such as is the case with Rang Di Basanti, an Indian film that came out in 2006. However, many examples of such support can come to mind. Instinctively, I answer no. However, the issues arise between what is domestic terrorism, where a society fragments into competing groups that are at war. Sometimes this results in new nations, such as India, Pakistan, uh, and Bangladesh. International terrorism, where two nations fight, such as what's happening uh, with India and its competing nations. This makes the waters much murkier. Time again, we see that when a society is unable to assimilate competing intergroup needs, so when there's different groups fighting uh, for their own tier loss, uh, then a war can result between the groups, which can escalate to form one or, mu one or more new nations. This is so recurrent, it makes it hard to denounce it morally as it seems to facilitate progress. As such, the obligation here seems to be to manifest a society that is quick to address, counter, absolve, and or assimilate intergroup needs before they become competitive, and especially before they become domestic terrorism, and certainly before they become irreconcilable war. If the competing concerns of a society's factions are irreconcilable, then grant them autonomy under an international, you do you over there, but allow us to do us over here, like we've done with North Korea, more or less. Otherwise, international war breaks out, which is harder to reconcile as max isolation is already granted. To note this explicitly, silencing the demands, concerns, and voice of a faction, not taking such quarterly, Pushing such underground is not a strategy capable of harboring an amicable resolution. All it does is embolden, embolden self and group righteousness, which is catastrophic. So this one is probably something worth elaborating on, which is yeah, this max isolation. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask about, actually. What, yeah. what, what did you mean by that? So... For instance, if we get two individuals battling it out, right? Like say with me and Tyler in our argument last week where we you know, came, came to the idea of, you know, we've argued our cases uh, and we found them unconvincing and let's go from there. We'll figure out which thing is correct behavior, right? Which is to say if, you know, two sides end up on a disagreement, something they can't resolve, then it's to then say that that's fine. That's completely fine. Uh, because you don't have entitlement to force the other person to agree with you. Um, and then you allow each mm. person to go off and then validate their idea, and then they can have something that may be more convincing, right? So, but the issue here is uh, you can do this with people. You can say, hey, you're doing behavior that isn't good for a friend. I'm going to cut you out. You can do you over there. Don't talk to me, right? Um, or you can do it with tribes, right? Where, or, you know, say for instance, with India, you have the Muslims versus the Hindus and that resulted in bloodshed. So eventually they just decided, screw it, we're fighting over different tea losses. Our ethos of those tea losses is not compatible. You go to Bangladesh and uh, Pakistan and we'll have India. And that way we can try and attain peace because that's the, the, it's just not sustainable any other way, right? So then you have huge collections of people then saying, hey, uh, you know, or we've considered our concerns ir uh, ir irreconcilable, so we grant you anonymity, you do you over there, but allow us to do us over here. 
However, if you do this at nations, right, then it's mm -hmm. to say like, uh, like say then if Pakistan and India have an issue, they're already abstracted out. They're already doing you do you over there, right? They've already achieved that max isolation, right? So now the only thing that they can do is, uh, is to address the needs of each other, to counter it with better things, to absolve it, to say, you know, we can figure it out where we don't have to make any compromises and or assimilate, which is to say, you know, we can become one and then share the burden, right? But if they can't do any of that, then it's to then to say, hey, there's no other choice here. Our telos are in competition and, you know, we're now at, we're fighting each other. There's some type of battle that is preventing us from doing you, do you over there and allowing us to do us over here instead of saying, you know, we now need to do us over your way or you need to do us over our way. Um, yeah. and There's kind of a, a, an example just to like in competition between each other, like a socialist nation versus or let's say a communist nation versus a capitalist nation. The capitalist nation will accrue much more resources than the communist nation. So there would be that kind of uh, incommensurability between the two where a communist nation wouldn't be able to uh, su survive and thrive on, on its own wh while while the capitalist nation is al already like eating up more of the resources that that's uh, like a, an argument that's sometimes put forward by the marxists out there just i i, I don't know I, I, as a, well, a, it, a, it's... yeah Sorry, yeah, yeah. Just as an example, for some, something to, to uh, I guess, uh, particular particularize the these abstractions into some sort of idea of like one certain ethos has certain requirements to it that are in regards to the broader context around it that it has to survive within. And so if the broader context required for a particular ethos such as communism is not available because capitalism also requires broader context that is in place. Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't know where it's going. But yeah. Yeah, well, I mentioned that in the um, in that Google Stadia thing, uh, and I, I mentioned this, uh, I think, one or two discussions ago. Mm -hmm. um, so this one here, which is that, so for instance, the issue with tech feudalism is, uh, uh, so I just, I've already read this bit out. So from my experience, USA tech progressives think that, uh, okay, no, I'm, I'll need to read out this thing. Uh, so this is very concerning as it means probably 99% of the population get a superior experience under this like tech, I'm going to have to read all that. This, so Google Stadia gaming platform, very oh, interesting. Can you explain? Because like at, at the beginning, oh, yeah. you, you just oh, yeah. leapt into it, but I'm not sure what this oh, yeah, keynote right. so, talks about at all. Oh, yeah. So Google Stadia is a new announcement by Google uh, that it seems to me is so brilliant. I'm surprised no one's thought about it. Um, so you are... So this is the, this is a whole thing. It's just a controller. Uh, mm -hmm. But where's the console? The console isn't in the controller. The console is in the cloud. So essentially, this removes the redundancy of powerful gaming computers in everyone's home, which is an expensive, redundant endeavor, and instead moves the gaming console to highly optimized server farms, then streams instantly to your device, which is cheaper and more efficient. Google says they proved this last year that performance was not an issue due to them controlling the entire tech stack through the controller, through the internet pipes to the server, achieving perfect security and optimal transmission with reduced hops. This allows instant unlimited 4K gaming with picture in picture even of your co-player's streams. So no more are you seeing what I'm seeing questions ever again. So they do like a little demo uh where's the fireflies thing uh, uh da, da, da. so anyway they do this like really nifty demo uh of like one of the reasons split screen hasn't worked anymore 
uh, or doesn't isn't in existence is because it's too comp like the games need to be more graphically intense now for modern audiences. But if they're more graphically intense, you can't be rent like they're too intense to now render two perspectives mm. at once. I see. Yeah. Um, so now, but with this, you know, everything's being rendered in the cloud. So these windows up the top are your co-players, right? So you can add like uh, everything. So the burden to the user here is just, it's the exact same burden. There's no extra burden to the user. All the burden is on an unlimited scalable cloud server infrastructure that Google has. So the user's still receiving the same data, um, but now they can see the real time, like 4K streams of all their co players at once, right? So even if they're playing on their mobile phone, they can still get, uh, and uh, like the only thing that is limited is the phone's resolution, pretty much, or your device's resolution. So and, you can and, get your and phone, the, uh, you, yep. And the uh, internet speed, I guess. Yeah, however, they said that they did a lot of tests last year and they were able to, they said all internet connections. Uh, now, I'm really skeptical about that, but uh, Google routinely pulls off uh, these things. Um, so uh, we'll see. Um, but yeah, like, you know, even way you could play like the game at 720p or something. Right, like it's just the compression of a YouTube video, but it's even more optimized. Yeah. Um, so I'm well, very well, concerned. I'm wrap yep. this up because I, I I need to wake up early tomorrow and. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So the uh, so the idea is uh, so to work on to your other point is uh, tech companies uh, kind of like this is one a hell of a concept, uh, and it could result in an issue of tech feudalism where some tech companies just become so powerful mm -hmm. that um, it's very concerning because this kind of eliminates like, so this also integrates with with YouTube. So you could see someone playing a game and then you could play the game directly with them without ever installing it because again, the game's installed mm -hmm. on the cloud. Wow. Right, wow. so you could watch PewDiePie play PUBG and then you press play with PewDiePie and it adds you to the queue to play with PewDiePie and then you're playing the game in Google Chrome instantly, right? That, so now that is such yeah. an incredible idea that, like, it's it's amazing that something like this hasn't had like been thought about in, in like science science fiction books or, or magazines or anything at all like that before. That it's yeah, it's I don't, I don't know. It's, it's so it's so amazing. Yeah, it's just because all that would really be needed to be done is instead of like computing everything on your own system it's just having a fast enough feedback between the movement of the control being sent off and then relayed to the the servers themselves and then uh them i don't know working off of it, that control yeah so that's like the uh yeah, it's just crazy. So this is like a YouTube thing, and then there's like a, a play, uh, and everyone can play together, like just viewing it instantly. So it's interesting. So Microsoft announced uh, with the Xbox One that they can do cloud computations for multiplayer, but they never thought, why don't we put the entire game in the cloud? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really interesting, um, but it's terrifying because it's just like, uh, you know, I, I went into my concerns about this because for all this empowerment that the tech world talks about, um, then it's going to also disenfranchise people because, you know, that YouTube and Google partnership um, for Stadia, then it's getting everyone in on the Google or the YouTube code of conduct. And that doesn't include everyone, which we went into about a few weeks ago with the uh yeah the, the uh Joe Jack Rogan, Dorsey, Tim Paul, Twitter, Jack Dorsey, yeah, Gotti. yeah well, Twitter pool bring right? up how they're particularly uh working under oh, they're using rules that are only made for a, a subsection of the political spectrum yeah and then that boots people off and then they become radicalized 
uh, in the private thing. So if Google becomes this huge tech company that is monitoring everything that people do and then um, is analyzing all of it and they kick you off when you exhibit bad behavior, well, you're going to be disenfranchised. You're going to be resentful. Not a good idea. And you can either address that by war or it seems by pretty much suicide um, and all the met, like, uh, in metaphorical uses of that term. Um, so the idea is like essentially the companies, if they're closed source, then they're just nationalistic. They're just playing the nationalistic game, um, which is interesting. But nationalism and corporatism has something that's like it's different from a government. Um, because a government that is nationalistic, it generally doesn't engage with the global market. But a nationalistic company that keeps everything closed, they can steal all the work of the global market. Um, Chinese companies do that because they don't have that strong IP uh, 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 terms. But uh, open source, like all the uh, companies, these big tech companies, they, you know, you publish something on an open source and then everyone uses it. Um, whereas the companies can then publish things closed source and then everyone else can't use it. So the companies are the, similar to the psychopaths, which is they have tricks up the sleeve that no one else can abide by. Whereas uh, the UN um, is interesting. So UN is democratic, things are voted by, you know, decided by the number of votes. Now China does significant investment into Africa um, and this video goes into it. So the UN essentially allows China to buy uh, to buy votes from Africa, and it's not explicitly to say buy votes because it's not saying hey, here's money to buy mm -hmm. votes. It's to say here's money. We're going to increase our integration with your country and your culture. Your ethos is going to become more like our telos. Therefore, you're more incentivized to vote because we become closer buddies and closer friends. Perfectly legal, perfectly legit, yeah. perfectly fine. But this is interesting because nationalists as countries can't compete with globalism mm. because of that. If you nationalize USA, the entire rest of the world can play a game you can't, right? And that's what happened with North Korea. The entire rest of the world progressed while North Korea kept staying impoverished, right? However, companies, uh, maybe the future is going to be where a private company doesn't exist anymore. Uh, that seems going to be I, the, well, the way to do that, which is you have the companies run by the UN, which also seems a terrible, bad idea, unless you open source everything, which is kind of what the libertarians want. They don't believe in, like, a, there was a declaration of cyberspace that we read out a while ago by the EFF founder. Um, and that's really, really good. So as to say, abandon intellectual property, all intellectual property, that's kind of what Tesla does with its open patents, and then companies can uh, compete. Uh, sorry, they can um, they can't play tricks that other people can't. Yeah. So. Okay. So final question, and then we can wrap up. Uh, just from what you were just saying, is it possible, perhaps, that a nation can remain nationalistic while? still making investments into other countries in a way that would ultimately benefit themselves because like is that a nationalistic move by china to uh benefit africa and, and yeah. its needs that it has so that it can pull like yeah. it, it can so bring what? about uh laws in in the un that ultimately benefit them to a greater degree yeah. So one of the most surprising things about Asia is Asia is still very nationalistic. However, they immigrate everywhere, right? Mm. So like in Sydney, it's like double digit percentage of homes owned in Sydney uh, is Chinese. Um, and that's surprising because Asia, and I'm not, I don't know that much about China, but from my understanding, at least looking to Indonesia, Thailand, many countries in Asia, Malaysia as well, it is pretty much impossible for us to immigrate over there and, mm -hmm. or even buy property over there. And yet uh, the digits of those of Asians in Australia is huge. 
and it's fine like it's legal fine it's just it seems like it should be mutual which is to then say hey if you can buy land or immigrate here then you have to allow us to buy land and immigrate over there because i swear if uh i could i and i think that's and i think the reason australia doesn't do that is because uh that's maybe where nationalism becomes a problem because people like me would get out of australia immediately because mm. i uh I love Asia so much. I, it's it's so much better economically and cyclically for psychologically for me. Um, just because you know money goes so much further over there. Like I can live on, uh, you know, US like like six hundred US a month, and right. live like a good middle class life. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, you know, and are in you, Australia, like, are are you perhaps in the exception then like in comparison to most australians maybe that let, let's say there is an asymmetry or maybe not an asymmetry but just a, a difference where there's a lot of people from thailand seeking to live in australia whereas in australia there's not as many people desiring to leave Australia yeah. to go to Thailand because maybe they're instead seeking yeah. to move to a more like if right. let's suppose like Canada and America and Japan are first world nations Australia is a first and a half world nation maybe most Australians are seeking like to move to San Francisco if they're part of the tech community or something like that rather than moving to Thailand where there's no booming businesses yeah well aussies are big travelers and like bali uh, is a lot of like it's pretty much all aussie says especially from western australia uh because it's cheaper to go to bali from western australia than it is to go to sydney from western australia but the uh the thing is is that most i'm not, actually i'm not sure on the stats but from nearly all of australia from my opinion seem to be blue collar workers there's some white collar workers but the white collar work is in supporting our blue collar workers it's in mining and hospitality and government and medical like you know all the infrastructure around supporting those blue collar workers right. um so the thing is is that those blue collar workers it doesn't make sense for them to go live over there because unless they have savings like again you could have a like uh you know a hundred thousand dollars would last you a very long time over there so uh you could do that like there's retired cheap dot uh dot asia or retired cheap asia and it's like a guy and he runs a youtube channel he's been running it for probably 15 years since youtube's inception pretty much and he's mm -hmm. found that pensioners can't afford to live in the west so he's got a whole blog and website dedicated to helping pensioners move to asia instead <laughs> uh and but so I think it's more that the, but I think the blue collars probably don't want to work, but the white collars like myself, uh, who work for more international clients, then it just makes way more sense. Uh, and also Australia, like many of the West, we, uh, it enjoys its comfort and I don't enjoy comfort. I feel like dying when I'm comfortable, uh, kind of thing, because I kind of stopped growing um and where if you're in asia you see things to be improved all the time mm. uh and every day actually makes you happy then because you're like there's things i can do every day to make <laughs> things better when like in australia it's just like the couch is like i don't know it's just as soon as australians get home it's like phone couch tv uh and a little bit of family and you know maybe they'll buy their incredibly expensive four-wheel drive and go for a little trip every now and then Mm -hmm. right but yeah so all right all righty i'll let you sleep uh and i guess you're joining the uh the our private session so if you're listening right well, uh oh, i will be busy from nine till probably 11 my time which i believe will impede upon the the private session uh, yeah. I, I might, I, I, I don't know. It depends upon when, uh, when I get back home. It, it might be the case yeah. that I get back home in time to at least be there for maybe the half hour. Well, maybe we should just cancel after. it then uh, instead so we don't risk anyone showing up and it's not, no one's there. Yeah. Okay.
I don't, I, yeah, so all right, so we'll cancel that one. That one you don't have to stress about it. Okay. Um, I can't do it because it's 4 a.m. my time. Yeah, uh, yeah, all right, so I'll cancel that session. And uh, But yeah, otherwise, please join. Uh, the links for these discussions are, are down below. You can actually participate in these meetings. We actually want to hear. There's a feedback uh, section on the forum, so you can submit feedback. Uh, please participate on the forum as well, but or follow along on the chats. But yeah, you can join in on the chats. We're happy to have you in on the chats, uh, uh, and you know, hear your feedback and, and learn from you. Uh, and you know, we're here to learn from each other. So, um, alrighty. Uh, thanks so much, John. Uh, been a pleasure. Yeah. And thanks, Tyler, uh, for joining earlier. As well. <laughs> yeah, I I do want to say uh, before just to. Throw it out there, I guess. Next Thursday, yes, next Thursday, I will be doing a public debate with Chris from the Biblical History Skeptic channel uh, regarding the topic of objective morality or more specifically, like moral nihilism, whether or not there are objectively true value statements that can be made, things uh, things like that. So that'll be exciting. That'll be first debate of mine. I wanted to kind of get in on this, uh, it, that'll be on the Modern Day Debate channel. So uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I'll-, I'll I could um, I could add a, uh, we'll follow that. We could add that to the Beverly calendar. So it's on like meet.beverly.me and then have the join link go towards that uh, maybe. It's Cause it'll be on next Thursday. So I could code that up. So that way the Beverly community can easily find it. And we have a little countdown with that nice little thing. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that'd be fun. But it, you, you don't need to do that. But it, yeah, that, that'd, yeah. Be, that'd, be, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and then um, also tomorrow after, let's see, it'll be one o'clock my time, which is CST. So 1 p.m. CST. I believe I will also be moderating a, a debate between uh, Adam Friended and Tom Jump regarding evolutionary strategies for groups and like religions religions as evolving ethics uh so, something something like that i believe so that'll also be fun because uh but yeah okay yeah busy right. busy month <laughs> all right as I, I send yeah post that in the uh the agenda topic that's linked in this video and okay. uh, then people can find it all cool. right cool all right see you john yeah good night babe. Good night, everybody.